when the, the charge went off, I was going down in the turret trying to like get back a little bit, you know, from the mm -hmm. blast. And it went off right as I was coming down, right like in the opening of the hatch. So it went off and it snapped my head back. My head cracked off the turret in that hole. <sighs> Nods messed up. And I came down the gun, like the saw hit me in the face as I was going down, <sighs> knocked me out for like a few seconds. It didn't just blow the gate open. It flattened the entire metal like framing and ripped it out of the courtyard. Blew every window on the house out, glass <laughs> everywhere. Whole thing smoky. Iraqis are like, Ugh, you know, like they're all messed up. And like, all of a sudden I see this, people just start walking out of the house, like stumbling out. I quit, hands up, like coughing, like stumbling. There wasn't to clear and everybody's just walking like, oh yeah, we get it, come here. You know, I have a seat. Hey guys, welcome back to the Dirty Civilian Podcast. We have an awesome guest today, Drew Estel from Bear Solutions. Before he started and founded Bear Solutions several years ago, he was a part of 5th Special Forces Group and deployed seven times to the Middle East. Uh, this podcast is full of wild stories. Uh, also his life story, which to our knowledge is the first time has ever been shared on camera. Uh, we also get into the training side of what he does and the cadre and team that he's built to help citizens become more prepared and more proficient. Drew Estel, thank you for being here. When, I, it, man. when I first met you, I was uh, 22 and terrified. <laughs> you have changed a lot over the past couple of years. Yeah, I've chilled out a little bit. We were at the uh, the Loophole Range in Oregon. You were terrified of Drew? Are you kidding? Yeah. Yeah, you're, you, you had that, uh, I don't want to call it a resting bitch face, but you had that resting... <laughs> bitch um, face. <laughs> I, I, can, I can kill you, and everyone here knows no. it. Uh, he but makes no. me feel safe. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm glad that that works for one of us. No, but then I got to know you, and uh, you have some. You do have some good qualities. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> That's the nicest. I'm gonna take that as a compliment. <laughs> That's the nicest insult I've ever heard. Oh, that well, was a good one. I mean it seriously. No. no, but really, thank you for being here. Yeah, yeah. it's uh, it's been it's been good getting to know you, and I look forward to getting to know you over this podcast more too. Absolutely, man. I appreciate you guys letting me come out. So I've known you guys for a long time and uh, the class we did in Shelton, Washington. That's after right. that too. Yeah. That was a cold day. It was very cold. That was too cold. Yeah. That was the coldest I've ever been on the range. <laughs> Hard to way. focus. Yeah, yeah. It was. Certainly. It was a good time. It was. So. Well, where are you from? Yeah. So originally, uh, I grew up in Houston, Texas, uh, outside of Houston in a place called Spring. Uh, so it's on the northwest side up there. Um, Grew up there, mom, dad, a uh, little brother who's nine years younger than me. He's a stud, by the way. Like, he's uh, living in Cleveland now. Uh, really good dude. So, grew up there, normal Texas kind of upbringing. You, you play football. I don't know if you knew that about Texas, mm -hmm. but you grow up and you play football. Like, that's it. Yeah. And if you're not good at football, you play baseball, right? Yeah. So, all the baseball players out there are going to love that. Um, <laughs> I can't. I, I respect baseball. Dumb sport. So, <laughs> I'm kidding, I'm kidding. So, uh, yeah, played football, did that, and then uh, kind of went to college a few times. You could oh, say that. <laughs> hold, hold, hold on, hold on. I've, I, I've, I'm trying to get away from doing this with most yeah. podcast guests because it just exacerbates the length of the video, but I want to know what were you like as a teenager? Oh, man. Uh, I was... I was different, I guess you could say. <laughs> so I was a little wild sometimes, okay. you know, but I did right. a good job of not getting in trouble, right? Oh, like, okay. um, I always kind of either got very, very lucky mm -hmm. or, you know, kind of somehow hit it. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Like, it's funny you asked that. My daughter asked me uh, the other day. She's, she has these cards, right? Like at dinner, she likes to ask questions. So we play mm -hmm. question games and all this stuff. She's like, what's a story about you, with like something wild or something like that when, when you were younger, like in, in high school? And I sat there and thought about it. My wife just looked at me. She was like, mm, like tread carefully, you know? I was like, nah, screw it. All right, so <laughs> <laughs> this one time, you know, so I told her a story like, you know, we were, uh, I, I left this part out with my daughter, but we may have been indulging in alcoholic beverages for oh, a while. Oh, okay, okay. And uh, my buddy had this big white F-250, right, uh -huh. uh, diesel. And we kind of grew up in the country, but like right on the edge of the country and like the suburbs. So it's kind of mixed right there at the time, not anymore. But we were driving around looking for some dude going from party to party, you know, doing all this stuff, you know, trying to meet chicks, you know, and be the cool guys, whatever, you know, like, <laughs> were, were you the cool guys? Where, I don't know. Probably not. Okay. I, I don't know. Uh, I never thought of myself like that, but no, I'll go no. And Joe, his name, we're like, dude, look at that golf course over there. He's like, yeah. I was like, 
that'd be great to go off-roading on. It's like, yeah. And then somehow it kept going. We're like, well, we have this barrel in the back of your truck. We should fill that up with gasoline and light it. And then like drive this, like just like a shooting star, you know, like <laughs> through the golf course. <laughs> and we did. And like the unfortunate part was the whole cab filled up with like smoke. Uh -huh. You know what I mean? <laughs> so like we can't see anything because we had all the windows of as we're doing the smoke is coming in the cab. Yeah. We don't see anything. And we're just hopping, you know, over like the sand bunker thingies, yes. or whatever they are. Yeah, the the sand traps. Sand traps, yeah. yeah. And all that. And then we like melted the inside of his truck, like the bed liner and his tailgate was covered <laughs> in black. And we didn't know what to do. So like, it's still burning. Like we put way too much gas in this <laughs> thing. And so we're doing all this. But we just like kicked it out. And then we had to like pull out. And for anybody who's from Houston in that area, there's this road called 1960. It is like the most heavily trafficked road, right? Like in, yeah. it's terrible. Okay. Yeah. Um, and it's like two in the morning and we're driving down this road in his truck with this barrel shooting flames <laughs> out the back with like me, Joe, and another guy. Uh, I think it was Aaron. I can't remember. But we're doing this. And then like, we're like, what do we do with this? Like, it's getting hot in uh -huh. the truck. You know? So finally we just like kicked it out in a ditch. You know, yeah. like we didn't know what to fucking do. Yeah. But uh, that kind of sums it up. Yeah. Um, that's kind of what we were like. <laughs> so, and then, oh but my yeah. Gosh. So, well, it's funny wild. you say that. So... That's what you all were doing in high school. In yeah. high school, you would know what my part-time job was. I worked at a golf course, a country <laughs> golf course, and it was my job to fix like all the pranks <laughs> and all the vandalism that, oh, yeah. that went on at the golf course. Yeah. And uh, so like I, I learned how to like fix golf carts and like I was like oh, yeah. using tractors and, and fairway mowers and stuff like that. So like, yeah, I would have been the next day at work, I would have went in and been like for all the people that on behalf of everyone like that, I'm sorry. Right? No, that was okay. so wrong to do. Like looking back at him, like you idiot. You know, like you can almost hear your dad's voice sometimes yeah. when you mess something up. It's like you idiot, yeah. right? Like that's how I feel now, right? Like, yeah. like God, you did so much dumb shit. Well, it's funny but, you did that in, in Houston because it wasn't there uh, any like it's it's really funny because I think high schoolers are like, oh, there's nothing to do in my town, and that was true for me in my super small town. Yeah. If you lived in Houston, there's yeah. plenty of things to do. But, yeah, still, near Houston, yeah. yeah, I lived on the outside. Okay, uh, all right. but yeah, there's plenty to do. Yeah. You know what I mean? But when you're 16 years old, you yeah. know, 17 oh, years yeah. old, like you can't, it's hard to go buy alcohol. So like, you got to go find a homeless guy, uh -huh. you know what I mean? And be like, Hey bro, we'll give you 20 bucks if you go buy us liquor. You know what I mean? Which is uh -huh. what we did. Yeah. Um, and then we do that and get booze, <laughs> you know, and all this other stuff. But like, that was kind of it, you know, yeah. you just go from house party to house party or farm field to farm field, you know, like partying out where hopefully the cops didn't see it. The yeah. cops were good. They had also the sheriffs in Harris County yeah. and Montgomery County, especially Harris. They were really smart. And they had off-road trucks, and they figured out all our little places. They were cool. They'd yeah. be like, oh, you know, guys, you dumbasses, like, poured out. We're like, yes, yes. officer, we're never disrespectful to a cop. Because, uh -huh. I don't know, it's not like today, like, they didn't have body cameras back then. Mm -hmm. Like, oh, he fell multiple times against, you know, <laughs> the bumper of his truck, you know. Like, and they knew all our parents, you uh -huh. know what I mean? Like, yeah. my dad was a fireman for a while. He's like captain. So, like, if I screwed up and the constables caught me, oh, man, dude, he's going to call my dad right then and there. Yeah. And I was dead. So yeah. I never wanted to get caught. I was really good at not getting caught. I can see your so. dad being a fireman. I don't know what he looks like, but it makes sense. <clears throat> he's a good dude, man. Yeah. He was a uh, he's a salesman, but mm -hmm. like we didn't have full time firemen. We're out. We only had volunteer. Yeah. So he, like back then, uh, he did, wasn't at the meeting when they elected the new captain. So everybody's like, I don't want to do it. They're like, Hey, Brian's not here. So they all oh. elected my dad, and he was pissed. <laughs> <laughs> but that was like how it was, you That's know. What I mean? But yeah, they did yeah. a lot of stuff, man. They were the the fire department in the area, and they a lot of brush fires, a lot of stuff, a lot of car wrecks. Yeah. So, do you have a good working relationship with him growing up? Yeah, yeah. I mean, he he worked his ass off. You know, sure. like my dad made a lot of sacrifices. He uh, everything was for the family. It was for my mom. It was for me. It was for Kevin, my little brother. Like everything was for us. Like he skipped certain opportunities he could have had to grow professionally in his business so he could maintain that we were in this good area, that we were going to good schools. Um, he worked his butt off, man. You know, wow. he did a lot for us. So very grateful for the way he raised us. That's awesome. What did, so, uh, what did, what did your mom do? My mom was a secretary. Okay. Yeah. I'm a, I'm a lot like my mom. I like my dad, but I'm a lot like my mom. My mom's also hilarious. Oh, right? okay. like she's, well, I'm not saying I'm, she's just she's just funny, right? She just doesn't give a shit. Like she cracks jokes. Yeah. She thinks things that other people don't think are funny. She thinks are funny. Oh right? yes. Like she can, she can laugh about stuff. Like 
I don't know how to put it. Like, I'll be like, oh, I'll like joking, like, oh, you bitch. You know, to my mom, and yeah. she'll be like, she'll be like, I'll beat your butt, you know? And she'll like, she'll <laughs> yeah. like come up and like, she'll headbutt or something playful. like that. Yeah, she can give playful, it back to you. Know? Then uh-huh. I laugh and she laughs. Yeah. She's very cool. She's like that. Gotcha. So she's a good lady. Nice. I was pretty fortunate, man. So I had good parents. That's good. But so, so you went from high school to directly to college or what, what yeah. was the, what was the path? So I went from high school. Um, Actually, yeah. So after high school, I went to a school in Ohio mm-hmm. uh, to play football and lacrosse. I played football and lacrosse. That was like my big sport. I can see of that. Of course. Yeah, I love yeah. lacrosse. Love it. My little brother played lacrosse. Um, so I went there to play. And then they dropped the lacrosse program like two weeks before I showed up. I don't know. To really? Some, you know, title, not whatever, you know, which, okay, mm-hmm. cool. But like ad sports don't take away kind of deal. Yeah. Well, they probably didn't have enough women's sports, so they had to yeah. take – that's literally what they did in my college. They would take yeah, away men's thing. sports so yeah. they could add women's sports. Yeah, which like, I'm all about, dude, add women's sports. But, like, yeah, we got people showing – you could have told us two weeks before school. Exactly. You know what I mean? I could have yes. made a better decision. So uh, went there to play football and lacrosse. It's called Marietta College. It's in Ohio, around the border of West Virginia. Um, and I looked at some other schools where I could play only football or only lacrosse that were bigger schools. But this, this and one other school is the only one that only played two sports. So mm-hmm. went there. They dropped the program. I played football there for a little bit, uh, just D3 school. And then I transferred to Texas State University. It used to be called Southwest Texas. So I transferred to Texas State to play football uh, to go there, which is like – it's called Division One AA. Now it's like football championship series or something. Huh. Hmm. But I ended up getting hurt real bad. Like I broke my back and like messed up in – bunch of concussions and the doctor was like dude you don't want to play football anymore wait how did that happen how did you break playing sports like squatting i used to work out hard like i used to squat like are you serious (laughs) like i don't know about that (laughs) yeah like i I could squat a lot of weight but i was really imbalanced so i couldn't deadlift a whole lot but Mm -hmm. i could squat i think my most i ever squatted when i was a freshman in college was six 10 or 620. It was low sixes, Golly. just over six. Yeah, it was ugly, but I did it. You do know what I mean? So that's probably of you back then. I think so somewhere. You should hook yeah. us up. Yeah, yeah. I don't know. They're probably in a box somewhere. <laughs> you know, my mom, my parents like storage space. Or something like that. But uh, yeah, that's probably how I broke my back uh, was squatting way too much for my size and weight. So, <laughs> so did you stop lifting heavy or did you stop doing sports or? Uh, yeah. So I went to Texas state, yeah. but I didn't play football anymore. Mm-hmm. So I joined a fraternity uh, that was interesting. Which one? Uh, it was called, so again, I got in trouble. Uh, <laughs> so they actually wouldn't let me sign the little thing at the end. They were like, dude, you can't even like sign it. Your grades are so bad. I'm like, what are you talking about? Like you have a zero, zero. Yeah. And, and like, I was like, correction. I have a 0.1 GPA. Correction. And then I got, uh, in trouble cause I got a big fight. So I got my, uh, anyway, blood, all this stuff with this dude who was way bigger than me and I have a smart mouth and I got... I got popped for it. Uh, but then the dean, I got put in probation. The second semester, I did just as bad. Then the dean brought me back in the office like, you're kicking you out of school. I was like, I think I want to join the army. He's like, <laughs> and he, the dean was like, of Texas State was like, I think that's a great idea. Oh and he was like, let me, like, let's look at recruiters. Yes. He's like, you need to get the hell out of like college. Yes. Go do something. I was like, yeah, I think that's a good idea. So then I <laughs> so after that, I left there. And then I went to a community college in Houston where I was working like, Driving a tractor for a little bit, was doing this, uh, like cutting grass, you know, and then cut people's property. I worked at Hollister of all places. Oh, so did I, bro. Yeah, yeah, man. Were, hey, were you, you know a what? model? What? That was no, a job absolutely title. Absolutely not. No, the reason a, I worked there, no, I wasn't a model. I was just on the floor. Well, that's the job title. Is it? Floor workers at really? Hollister is model. Oh, okay. yes. So at this place. What year was this? I don't know, 2000. Five, I think. Yeah, 2005. Dude, so in the that's Woodlands, the Texas. same year that I worked at Hollister. Oh, dude. Hey, guys. The rest of the team here at DC, they love to make fun of me because I'm terrible about eating. I forget all about it. I get so busy in the work, so busy in the edit, so busy tinkering with gear and new things. I inevitably forget to eat. And at the end of the day, I'm like, I have to just stuff my face. And it's not always the greatest food. And that is why things like factor meals are actually pretty convenient. My wife and I have used them off and on over the course of the past few years when we need them, when life is just so crazy, we don't have time to meal prep for ourselves and all of our kids. So if you're looking for a way to eat better and eat more healthy and eat in a way in which, uh, you know, is a little bit more intentional, uh, Factor is a great option. So right now you can save 50% on all meals by visiting factormeals.com slash DC50. 
Uh, you know, we have all this gear and all this kit, but unfortunately, uh, you can't eat it. Ultimately, you actually have to sustain yourself. So uh, for me, definitely makes things a lot easier, and maybe I can get a little bit bulkier, and these guys can stop making fun of me by loading up on some protein meals from Factor. Again, you can save 50% off all your meals at factormeals.com slash DC50. Hit it up, fill up your bellies, not too much, but just enough, and then get back to work. So at this place, I don't know if it was like your – the reason I, I got the job and the reason I wanted the job, there was a hundred and like something employees. Most uh-huh. of them just come in seasonally to stand in front of the store, right? Uh-huh. So I went in, I'm talking to this dude. He's like the only guy there, right? There's like two guys. And this, the guy was like the manager. Uh-huh. I'm looking, I'm like, hey man, can I have a job? He's like, I don't know. I'll give you an interview. I was like, all right. I go, do guys work here? He's like, nah. <laughs> no, he goes, no. we have seven males that work here and like a yeah. hundred females yes you know and some of them are you know full-time some are like part-time only once in a while just for the discount but i was like yeah. oh Perfect. i want to work here now yeah yeah <laughs> that's so i the, talked to him and i got a job <laughs> same dude same with, i was like i was like discount and uh, yeah. this is how bad this is how you know you're getting into a terrible job is that yeah. they do group interviews <laughs> yes and that's so, that was it yeah I went, we went out. i went to a group interview with this girl i liked at the time and yeah. we both got jobs there for like christmas mm-hmm. or whatever and then it was like i'm the only dude here oh yeah this is great yeah it was. Yeah. It was awesome because they'd have parties and stuff. Mm-hmm. And the girl's like, hey, do you want to go to a party? I'm like, oh, yeah. I don't have, I'm not good at talking to like women and stuff. You know, yeah. I'm like, I just know if I put myself in this situation, uh-huh. eventually I'll like meet some chicks, right? You know, <laughs> that was like my mentality. The biggest but, problem for me <clears throat> was I was, I was 19 and all the girls coming into the store were like, <laughs> not old enough. Yeah. And it was super awkward. Yeah. And I was basically told like, Cause I, I would, I would oh, yeah. be like dismissive of them, you know? Yeah. And, uh, then like my boss is basically just like, Hey, you need to be more friendly to the younger girls. And I'm just like, I feel weird about that. What? Yeah. Yeah. And I was, and he was like, yeah, you need to like just flirt it up. some." I'm like, I'm not doing that. Yeah. And no. I, I've been, I just never showed back up. Yeah. I, I think I worked like two weeks and then I was like, no dude, yeah, it was I'm a done. weird place to work. Yeah. It was it was a very weird place to work, and I didn't like it. Yeah. You know what I mean? But yeah, like headaches all the time from all the oh, fumes. Yeah, they put the, the sprays and shit. Uh-huh. I'm like, dude, it was so bad. <laughs> but I don't know. I paid money. You know, I got money, and then uh, and then after so when I moved back there, I went to a community college at that time in, mm-hmm. in Texas, and then uh, then I got kicked out of the community college, and I was like, I should probably legitimately join the army now. So <laughs> I'd always wanted to be in the army. Why did but, you always want to be in the army? My uncle was a Green Beret. Okay. In oh, Vietnam. All right. Yeah. So like growing up, I had his Green Beret. And mm, wow. So I want to be a Green Beret. I had like the SF Sear, you know, field manual, all this stuff he sent me. I had his old uniforms and like the whole time I went through the Q course, I had his Green Beret. And like when I graduated, he was like, You got your own? I'm like, Yeah. He's like, then send me mine back, damn it. I was like, Yes, sir. <laughs> sure enough. I got sure. it. Yeah. So he's a lawyer now, big time, you know, he was, you know, he retired, but uh really cool dude. Um, but yeah. I uh, had his groom brother the whole time until I graduated. So, were you into all of the, you know, all of that kind of lifestyle before? Did you just, did you just want to be a green beret, or were you into shooting and war and all this stuff, like all of it? Right, like yeah. I never really shot guns until I joined the military. You know, gotcha. like we just wasn't. It wasn't a thing we did in my family. No, it was always sports, sports, mm-hmm. sports, sports. You know, I wrestled for a year. I played lacrosse and football. You know, all through high school and all that. Um, it was sports, workout, and sports. Excuse me. Um, but like growing up, my buddy Kirk, uh, he's a third group dude. Now we grew up, he ended up playing football in A&M and all this other stuff. And I ended up joining the army before him, but like growing up, we would dress up like Navy SEALs and Green Berets, you Mm -hmm. know, and, and recon Marines and like all this stuff, you know, like we would, our like fun was, can we go to the army surplus store? And we'd yes. like go, we'd save our money and like buy something or we'd get Navy SEALs with Charlie Sheen, you know, mm-hmm. or we'd get yeah. like Chuck Norris movies, you know, or Commando, you know, or all this stuff. We just watch movies, you know, we read books and, you know, we get Soldier of Fortune magazine. We're like, this is so cool. You <laughs> it's know? funny because like, that's what him and I do now full time for a job. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So yeah. it was, <laughs> that was good. Uh, yeah, this is what we did, man. Like that was it. Like that's all we wanted to do. Like if we played a video game, it was like golden eyes so we could like shoot each other. You know, we're yeah. like trying to figure out how to clear stuff and we'd swim in like Kirk's mom had a pool, you know, so we'd swim in the pool and do like drown proofing and we tried to like, we'd tie up our hands and feet yeah. and then like try and get the goggles off and then like 
we didn't know. You know, we're like, oh my God, I'm dying. You know? And Kirk's like, I couldn't tell, you know, and we're like, you know, drowning in the pool and his yeah. mom's yelling at us. Like, you can't do that. <laughs> like, I mean, it was terrible, you know, but that's all we did growing up. Like that was what we liked to do. So when gotcha. we were real little, uh, we got in high school, you know, it wasn't like that, but it always kind of stayed. So yeah, what, I ended up joining the army. And what year did you join? Uh, I left January 6, 2006 is when I went to shipped off for basically. Did you have any uh, kind of gut feelings when 9-11 happened? Yeah, I was in high school when that happened. Yeah. I remember I was in class. Uh, was it, man, junior. it was either sophomore or freshman. I can't remember. I think it was a sophomore. I was a sophomore and you're a year older. Okay, so I was a freshman. And I remember Miss Eric. I do remember her. And I was in her English class because she lived behind us at the time. Yeah. Um, I remember that happening and be like, what? That's weird. And I saw my friends, like these two guys, they're out now, really good dudes. They're twins, identical twins, the Kuglers. They ended up going, joining the army at the same time. Mm. <clears throat> and they both like, was it Ramadi or Mo whatever, Mosul, something like that. Like they mm. were there for all that, dude. Wow. They were second ID, I think, both of them or something. But they did that. One of them got hurt pretty good, uh, Purple Heart and all that. But then they ended up getting out. They did. So I saw guys going and doing shit. But I was like, well, I'm going to go to, I'm going to play football, you know? And, and my dad was always like, Go to college. Just before you do any of that, just go to college first, you know, get a little life experience. I'm like, all right, cool. And then I was like, hey, dad, that didn't work out. You know, this, this college thing, like if I don't have sports and like the, the coaches to be like, sit down and do your studies, you know what I mean? Like, uh -huh. I'm not going to do it. So I don't care. Mm -hmm. So I think I was an English major at one point, which was hilarious, right? Like I didn't, I just well, checked something. I was like, ah, English. I was like, <laughs> that whatever, dude, I don't know. Like, is, is there like working out? Is that a fucking, yeah. you're like, <laughs> is that a degree? <laughs> Not at this school, yeah. right? So I was like, oh God. But yeah, joined the army and later on. It still seems so. like some of those college studies that you did may have, I don't know. Maybe you went back to school later on. I'm sure we'll get to that. But like you've yeah. written books now and you've, yeah. you're very good with words and <clears throat> teaching and education and everything. So do you feel like during that time period where you bounced around to different colleges and you were hoping to play sports, but didn't really, did yeah. you, did you get some life experience from that? I got what not to do. Okay. Um, I, I, yeah. So I worked on sixth street in Austin for a while when I was at Texas state and I was a security manager. I was 20 years old. And I was a security manager at a bar. And so we'd get contracted by the real world, the TV show. So like the way that works on MTV when they have the real world, there's a real world Austin at the time. They have different bars they go to. So when they contracted our bars, which were owned by these Lebanese guys, we would go, which was, I worked at Fuel, there was Treasure Island, Spill, Chrome, Vinci, you know, like a few others, right? So when they'd go there, somehow I got like, you're the dude for the real world. I was like, what? So like, I'd like hold the little <laughs> rope, right? And be like, oh, you you girls can come in, right? Or yeah. not. And I looked just like one of the guys named Wes on the show. So like all the little drama behind the scenes, I got to see some of that, you know? Um, but it was interesting, right? So that was basically my college experience, right? So when you ask like doing all this stuff, did I learn anything from college? Not a damn thing. Not one thing did I pick up from college, you know, to help prepare me to write the book or teach classes or the business stuff we're doing now. Honestly, all that came from the military. Every single bit of it came from the military. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Wow. You could have stayed all four years and still not have learned that stuff. Absolutely. Like, I, so I went to college later, like online degree, right? Mm -hmm. I do that when I was in Iraq. Then I actually enjoyed it because I'm like self-teaching. I don't want to listen to some schmuck sit up there and talk about stuff. Like yeah. I mean, there's great professor, professors, but like there's also not great professors. You know what I mean? <laughs> yes. <clears throat> so... Well, and people learn know. different ways too. Yeah, I learned on my own really well. Yeah. So, so you know, go ahead, Drew. So you, so you joined the army. Yeah. I'm sure you breeze through basic. Yeah. Given I your mean, level of fitness. Um. Yeah. Yes and no. Like, yeah. I mean, everything. Some things are harder for others. Like, I mean, looking around at some of the kids in our basic training, I was like, oh my god, like really, dude. You know, like sure. Some kid pissed on himself because he was scared. It's like, dude, it's basic oh. training, bud. Like we're in basic training, you know. Like it's not. They, that's yeah. just the way they talk. Imagine they all talk like Samuel L. Jackson, right? Yeah. Like that's just how it is. <laughs> you know, like it's not a big deal. Uh, but I was never like a long distance runner. Mm -hmm. Like I can sprint. Well, we got to go over a mile, Whew, buddy. You know what I mean? Gotcha. So that I had to kind of get my body accustomed to that. Sure. But that was about it. Did you so, appreciate discipline? Yeah, I like structure. Right. I mean, some of it's dumb, but it's supposed to be, you know what I mean? So well, it's just the way it's designed, but yeah, I like structure and the routine. Like I get a lot from that. I'm very, uh, productive in those kind of situations. Makes sense. So how did you go from joining to 
what we all know you as, which is Drew Estill, the Green Beret. Okay. So when I first joined, um, it's funny because I was doing I was doing MMA at the time at a gym in Houston. Uh, the guy's name was Eve Edwards. It was called Revolution Dojo. I don't think it's still around, but it might be. So I was driving like down there. <clears throat> so I talked to a recruiter like, dude, I want to I'm going to join the army. I want to be at SF. I heard this is 18 X-ray contract. He's like, absolutely. We'll get it for you. We'll kind of find out <clears throat> they can't give it to you. One, I like twisted and torqued my knee really bad, like right before. So he's mm -hmm. like, you got to stop doing that. So I had to like take off the crutches and like go get my physical exam. And they were like, no, you had this previous shoulder, shoulder surgery from college where you were playing football. Like that automatically disqualifies you for anything airborne. I was like, what? Wow. No. Well, I'm not joining. So finally they convinced me like, hey, man, you can go like 11, be infantry, and then you can go later. You know, so I was like, well, we'll find out. So that's what I did. So you had all these pre-existing <clears throat> injuries. You broke your back, mess up your shoulder. Yeah. Did I, you I didn't break my back full until later, but like I tweaked it really bad to where it was like the spine was jacked up. Yeah. You know what I mean? Gotcha. So, so you entered with all of that like oh, yeah. already built up. Yeah. The only thing I could not hide and lie about was the shoulder because there was a <laughs> scar right here oh. right, where they did like that. So I tried to, and the doc was like, what is that scar? I was like, oh, I don't, I just cut myself, sh you know, like shaving. <laughs> yeah. Like, <clears throat> he was like, not nah, dumbass. Like, I know what that is. So wait, can someone so. actually come in off the streets and go directly to Green Beret selection? You or could. You still have to do a lot of things first. Okay. But you have a spot. So what they'll do is say, hey, man, we'll guarantee you a spot in uh, S SFAS, like selection. But you still got to go to basic training. You still got to go to airborne school. You still have to go to SOPC one and SOPC in like these prep courses. And if you make it through all that, and if you're still around, we'll send you to selection. Doesn't mean you're getting selected, but like, so for me, they wouldn't give me that contract. <clears throat> well, in basic training, I was actually a mortarman 11 Charlie, which I was super pissed about. I was like, what is that? Like, right? I'm supposed to be an infantry guy. So like the SF recruiter would come around and be like, Hey, does anybody want to go? And like, he, he talked to a few guys. Uh, one of my buddies, good friends for a long time was there too. And he ended up going to third group and all this stuff incredible like genius dude right so he ended up picking up the contract that way while i wasn't around i was in the mortar square so i just called this dude every day every day and he finally was like you're calling me again i was like yes master sergeant you know you're not even <laughs> supposed to call him Matt. i didn't know yeah. and i'm like yes uh, i'd really like a contract and he's like he's like fuck it if you can be down here in 20 minutes i'll give you one i was like what building number, you know? And then I went and told one of the drill sergeants who hated me, right? He'd always give me shit. I was like, hey, Master Sergeant So-and-So said, you need to drive me down there right now. Oh, my god! And gosh. he was like, he's like, motherfucker, fuck you. I ain't doing <laughs> shit for you. I was like, he said you. I don't know how he knows your name. And he was like, he knows my name. And so he like <laughs> drove me down there. And then I was oh like, I gosh. hopped out. I was he's like, do I need to come in? He's like, you said, I was like, no, 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 you're good, man. You don't need to come in. And then I ran in there <laughs> and like he left. So I had to like walk back, but I got my contract that way. Wow. So, wow. Yeah. So I just called him and just annoyed the shit out of him. He's yeah. like, can I please have a contract, Master Sergeant? You know, <laughs> he's like, oh my God, fine. You know, <laughs> he might have let me sign up for it. Squeaky wheel. Yeah. I used to remember his name. I can't remember it anymore, but. It was, it was an interesting little meeting. So what was that transition like? What, I mean, what all did you have to go through? Because you mentioned yeah. that there were some, some phases that you had to, mm -hmm. to work through. So had you gone through Airborne at that point? Not yet. So I was scheduled to be uh, 11 Charlie, so a mortarman. And I was supposed to stay at Fort Benning. I was going to 3rd ID Kelly Hill. And everybody's like, this is the worst place to go ever, right? Minus like one or two other places. So I got that contract and immediately, like the next week, I went to airborne school because uh, it was right before graduation. So I went to airborne school, did that. And then you go to Fort Bragg and you check in and there's like these little blocks. I don't know how they do it now, but it's like special operations preparation course, right? So that 18X contract was really designed for guys from other services that have prior service that they can come in. But sometimes you get guys right off the street, right? You know, and they've never been in another unit and they do well. Uh, fortunately, I was one of those guys. And they kind of do it like periods of time and then it'll go away. And then like later on, you know, when the wars happen, it'll probably come back. Uh, so that's kind of how I got in. But there was a few like blocks in front of that where they teach you a few things. But mostly it's just getting smoked and working out. You don't learn a whole lot other than like what not to do and when to do things. Uh, and then you go to selection and do your best. And the key course starts after that. Mm. Yeah. So, uh, you remember back in the day, I think, what was his name? Aaron? Aaron. There was a guy. So back whenever I was uh, doing the executive side of scouting and we had all of those uh, scout masters or scout leaders that were uh, oh, fifth group yeah, dads. Yeah, I call him Charlie. 
Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So I remember back when I met him, and I was like, "Do you know Drew Estel?" And he was like, "Yeah, I know Drew." Yeah. And uh, um, but so, so this is probably a point like eight, nine years ago, something yeah. like that. Um, I know I knew you from Fifth Group. I knew him, and I knew a couple of other dudes. And the thing that you all kind of had in common was you're all very, um, very professional. Do you think that that um, that list of all those courses and all those things that someone has to do before they get into a position like yours, do you think that kind of um, prepped people to be professional within the Berets, like within the Green Berets, or? Yes and no. Okay. So a little bit, right? But really what determines that is, is the team in your environment once you, you graduate and you go, right? Okay. Like every ODA is a little bit different. You know, so like our team, so I was on a Halo team. I showed up and somehow magically went to a Halo team. People were not happy about it, right? Yeah. So I went there, um, which was what I was told when I got there. They were like, you're never going to that team. That's the best team in the battalion. I was like, okay. Then they're like, hey, man, you're going to that team. And people got mad. Really? What, yeah, so one guy, uh, Knipe, he works for Magpul, or he used to. He was like the first guy. So he was leaving the company as I got in. And I remember sitting in the B team and him just being like, that's the best team in the company. Guys, we're gears to go there. Your ass ain't going. So don't even think about being on a Halo team. Then I go me and Sergeant to come back. He's like, oh, yeah, what team are you going to? I was like, Halo team. You know? Uh. <laughs> he was so mad. You know? But uh, yeah, he was so mad. But um, anyway, yeah, cool guy. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, I think it's the environment you're in, right? Like I showed up and... My team sergeant was, he went to Halo school in 1993, I think, or 91, mm -hmm. right? So he'd been jumping for a while. It's been a while. Yeah, I think yeah. he should have been a sergeant major like three times and he kept getting bumped down and he'd do it on purpose because he's like, I won't be no sergeant major, right? He's like, so uh -huh. he's a team sergeant of like four different teams. It was crazy. Uh, he was a good dude, but he was just an older guy, no time for bullshit, very mm -hmm. direct and blunt and, you know, just that guy, right? Yeah. Uh, but cool guy. And then, so him and the other guys on the team, we just knew how, to, how it was. Like, mm -hmm. I mean, it was every day you're like, oh, my God, I hope my bags aren't in the hallway. You know, because I'm 23 years old. Then there's three of us that showed up to the team. One guy showed up to the team was in his late 30s, brand new guy. Or mid-30s, excuse me. Another guy was my age. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. uh, an ec or camo dude. And then me. And there's two of us that are 23 years old. Everybody else on the team is over 33, 35. You know, yeah. so like a lot of experience, it's time to shut, shut your mouth and just see how things work and see how they do things. Cause we're the young kids on the team mm -hmm. and they, right now they, they're not thinking too highly of us. So we got a lot to prove. You know what I mean? Gotcha. For those so, who don't know, can you explain halo? Yeah. So it's uh parachuting, right? So you see like the static line, people jump out. Well, this is free fall. So that's what we did. Cool. Like think of skydiving for the military. Sure. You're wearing all your kit and all that stuff. Uh, so yeah, did that for a while. So you get on into a Halo team, mm -hmm. having broken your back and messed up your shoulder, and being told, "Hey, you can oh, never yeah. do this stuff." How how does that just you just tough it out? Like okay. oh well. So I do a yeah. lot of stuff to try and strengthen it, you know. Uh -huh. But uh, just deal with the pain, yeah. you know. Um, and then later on, got more injuries, you know. <laughs> um, so just to kind of tell you, all the injuries I had through the career. So I had both my knees done. Uh, they were just like meniscus, you know, tears, but I don't have meniscus anymore. Uh, they just had to cut them out because if they did the other kind of surgery, it would have been longer for mm -hmm. me to recover, but they just cut them out. I could get right back on a deployment pretty quickly. Um, and then I had my left ankle. I was doing some training. I tore all three ligaments, I think, just clean on my left ankle. And so I had surgery on that to repair them. And then the first run after like six months or eight months, like, all right, you can go for a light run. It's like, sure. So I went to Rotary Park in Clarksville, got half a mile in, rolled my ankle, tore them again, Just swelled oh up God. like a grapefruit. And I was like, Good. oh my God. You know, like, yeah. of course. Um, and then I ended up breaking my neck. Uh, pretty good. So I heard he had three discs and it was cracked and it was pushing on spinal cord. So this, like my left hand is permanently like it atrophied because it was a year before they realized it. Even though the original x-rays and MRIs were like, oh, that's clearly messed up. You need surgery now. Wow. This one guy was like, yeah, you're fine. I was like, oh, oh geez. well, come to find out like, uh, hey, man, is it weird to like uh, shit your pants? They're like, what? <laughs> and like, I'm dropping things with my left hand and like, it just seizes up and like, uh, you know, like weird stuff's happening. Uh -huh. And then they looked at it, it as like, stop it. Because I'm going to jujitsu, I'm going combatives, I'm rolling like three days a week. And they were like, stop 
everything right now. You need like right now surgery. This happened over a year ago. This could be permanent. So we got like, a, like what went to Walter Reed and we got surgery within like two weeks of finding that out or maybe three wow. weeks. Yeah. It was like a rush thing. They're like, we don't want this to go any longer. So they ended up fusing my neck. Um, what caused your, your neck to be so damaged? I think it was, it was already kind of worn out from football and sports and then, uh, you know, just little shit, but I was at a, a course in the military where it's called Sephardic. So it's like a assaulter school, right? And, oh, it's so cool. It's such a great school. Um, pretty long, but we're doing like combatives training and everybody's going light. It's like a head control drill. Everybody's going nice and light, you know, not trying to hurt, but doing the drill properly. And this one dipshit, I'll never forget that fat piece of shit from first group. Um, <laughs> this curly haired little fuck, like everyone hated him. So like he's the I last I can picture dude. him right now. Oh yeah. He, he, yeah. Like, Fuck that guy. So anyway, we, <laughs> we're sitting there and we're going through these like rounds as the last round. And he's like, yeah, like, yep, go ahead. He grabs on, you know, back of the head here. And we're just supposed to like side, side, control a little bit and then work through. And he buzz goes off and he just drops to his knees and cranks my neck straight down. Oh, oh yeah. So like I couldn't like, mm. they were like, hey, Batman. So I'm like, you know, doing this, like turning and looking. <laughs> like I couldn't move my neck. It was pretty funny looking back at it, right? But I mean, I couldn't take some of the pills because we're shooting guns during the day. So like, as soon as I got done, I'd get like a shot and I'd get some pills and, but I couldn't take anything during the day because we don't want to do that because there's guns and live ammo right. and demo and all this other stuff involved. So my we, gosh, uh, dude, yeah, it sucked. So, and was that just like exacerbated by all the deployments? Yeah, and probably, gear, yeah. you know, just little shit, yeah. you know, just, and just over time, you know, bad posture, you know, stuff like that. Yeah. Um, Have you ever looked this guy up? No, I don't remember his name. Good answer. Like, I'm pretty good sure. Good answer. I'm pretty sure he, he's one of those guys that like probably didn't do so hot in his. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Like somehow he was there, or whatever. Yeah. But, I don't know. Maybe he's a great guy. Maybe he's a good dude. Maybe just a weirdo, and nobody liked him there. But I doubt it. Yeah. Uh, I'm still. I'm. You can tell I'm a little bitter about it. So, I don't like him. <laughs> yeah. yeah. He yeah. might be a great dude. I don't know, but I don't like him. Yeah. So <laughs> well, he, he probably stays up at night just thinking oh, yeah. about how he's like. You know, all the people he's hurt. <laughs> so yeah. Just like your piece of crap. <laughs> no, hopefully. Uh, so, so, uh, so you get through selection. How was that for you? It's good. You know, I'm not gonna say it was easy. It's not. Sure. That shit's hard. The cool thing about our selection was they were starting Marsoc mm -hmm. at the same time. So we had a lot of the Marines, like these officers, coming down to watch and observe oh, our selection. Okay. We actually had a few Marines go through our selection. So our selection was like it was a July August class. And it was the first one they'd done in a long time because of the heat. And there was only 200 people in it. And it was all combat arms and x-rays. Like, that was it. That's all who was allowed in. Um, so it was like a test class. Um, so they had the Marine guys there and everything else, which was kind of neat. So we did that selection. It's not easy. Um, so I remember I was sitting there and, like, we couldn't do anything during the day. Not all the time, but, like, most of our events were done at night because mm -hmm. of the heat. But during the day... They have you doing dumb shit, so you're not sleeping, right? Mm -hmm. So you're just sitting there in the heat. And I remember I had this, like, migraine for, like, two or three days. You know, like everybody. Everybody's hurting somehow. It's not a big deal. But, like, I'm sitting there, and I hear this guy come up and go start saying something to me. And I'm sleeping against a tree, not thinking. And he, go, he said, oh, something, something, something. I can't remember what it was. Like, how's it going out here? You know, how's it working for you? Blah, blah. And I was like... I, like everybody else, bro. Like pretty cool. Like whatever. Not thinking. I hear, <clears throat> I was like, I know what that means. I fucked up. So I turn and look and I see one of our cadre like sitting there, like the guys that like assess us. And he looks at my thing. It was like Ross number 128. It was 128 or 126. I still have my, he's like, he like writes down on a oh. book. And I was like, fuck. And I look up the guy talking to me is just this guy, Marine Corps, like perfect uniform it was a colonel or a general or something. I can't remember because it's real small, but like <laughs> he's just big smile, bright teeth, like, ah, you know, great hair. And I was like, I go, fuck. And I stand up and go, sir, I apologize. And he's like, oh, you're good, man. Sit down. And I look into, over his shoulders, the cadre, and he's just shaking his head no. Like that. <laughs> oh my I'm God. like, great, I'm not getting, I'm not getting selected now. Yeah. Fuck, you know, I screwed up. But <laughs> that was, it was cool seeing the Marines there. The yeah. uh, Marsoc's a really good unit. They come a long way. Um, it's kind of neat to see how they've grown, so. So what was your uh, first deployment once you got onto the Halo team? Uh, we deployed in, I got there in October and we deployed in January, I believe. Um, if 
if I remember right. And that was in 2008. I got there in October 2008. We put in January 2009. Uh, and that was like a nine-month deployment to Iraq. So it was good. It was a good time. I learned a lot from the guys. Um, we had been going back to that team house. This was the second or third trip to that team house. And we do another one after that. Mm. So we kind of own that area. Um, so it was pretty neat. Uh, the trip before that, one of our guys, Jason Brown, he was killed on that trip. So like having a guy on our team killed the trip before, and then there was a first group team that took over, you know, and, and ripped us out. And then we're taking over again because we're going, it's us, another team, us, another team, us, and just kind of how the deployments worked. <laughs> So hearing that from the dudes and seeing his picture, you know, and the guys talk about that and you know, show us, you know, step by step, everything that happened um, was going to that deployment. It's a new, I mean, I've never done this. I'm thinking we going to go get it, right? Yeah. Like we going to mess these dudes. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Um, the political climate was weird at the time. So we did everything we could, you know, we got out, we did our jobs, you know, went on missions and drove around and trained guys and, and did all that stuff. But, uh, you know, it was just interesting seeing that before the deployment, like I wasn't there for that, but this whole team was. Mm -hmm. Everybody on that deployment, minus me, Scott, and Mike, the new guys, were all there for that. You wow. know, or they were on another team. Like we had a guy from the dive team that came over to backfill us, you know, uh, for one of the jobs. And that was interesting. So, uh, but we had a good time. We had a real good time. So went out, did some stuff, uh, had a great team, really good leadership on the team. Um, I learned a lot. How yeah. so is it different from what you were expecting? Well, I guess I don't, I don't know, you know, but I think because that was so fresh for the guys on our team, they're like, Jason was killed and we're going right back. Yeah. So you can imagine mm -hmm. how they felt, you yeah. know? And I'm like, okay. So they was like, well, I better step up my game. Cause I got a feeling these dudes are going to be wanting to go out and get some, sure. right? Mm -hmm. Like they're going to be, we're, we're going to be hitting certain areas and we're going to be chasing certain guys, yep. you know? So, um, that was interesting, not being a part of it and then seeing how they viewed it, you know, going into it. So I think that's kind of what I mean. You so, know what I mean? They're going out to, yeah, to kill people. Right. You know what I mean? I was like, yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 That's, yeah. That's this your sounds job. like fun. Yeah, right. that's yeah. what we signed up for. So I mean, we don't ever want anybody to die, but but also let's go. Yeah. You know. Yeah. So <laughs> anyway, that was interesting. But I learned a lot on that trip. Uh, I was a junior Bravo, I was a weapons sergeant. I learned a whole lot on that trip. So mm. that was a good. Uh, introduction, you know, and seeing how everybody does things. Gotcha. But, you know. Just in terms of like learning your job or your place on the team, like what? All of it. Yeah. Learning Everything. like on an operation, what am I doing? You know, how am I working with this team? How am I managing my guys? Like my, you know, Iraqis that I'm mm -hmm. running with, you know, I've got a squad or that, you know, this other guy's got a squad. How are we communicating? How are we managing them? <laughs> how are we clearing these parts of the city? You know, mm -hmm. how are we going after this objective? And then how are we training guys up? You know, like here's the guys that we have. He's a, we have to train them and then we have to go out with them. You know, we have to equip them. We got to do all this stuff. Mm -hmm. Expl explain that because I think a lot of just us normal people don't understand that relationship very well. So you yeah. said, you know, like you said, my Iraqis. Yeah. So tell us what, what you did with them and what yeah. that looked like. So usually, like, and some SF teams will operate unilaterally, like I think is the term, <laughs> unilaterally. So that means they're just doing shit on their own. Right. Um, they're not working and side by side or what they say by, with, and through a local partner force. Uh, our team was. So we had an element of the Iraqi army in our area, and that was our like guys. Right. So mm -hmm. we trained them and we take them, took them out on missions. So we'd train them, we'd do all this stuff, we'd brief them the mission. And then it was like, okay, you guys are in charge of this team that's going to brief. You guys are in charge of cordon, you know what I mean? And, and mm -hmm. securing the area you know, all this different stuff. So for one mission, you might have a squad, you might have a fire team and we're going after this, you know, person in this building or, but you're taking them out and you're leading them. Because the goal is we don't want to be in Iraq forever. We don't want to be in Afghanistan forever. At the same time, we don't also just want to up and leave one day and completely equip and fund the Taliban to have a modern military force. Yeah. You know, fucking Democrats. But with all that said, right? Um, we would, our job is to train them up to the point where they don't need us. Mm -hmm. And there's been some really good successes with that, with some, especially some of the Iraqis and certain Afghan and Kurdish partner forces that we've had, um, just in general, there's also going to be some guys where like, Hey, they just suck. Right. So you're just yeah. using them as a means to an end, but there's kind of both in there. So ideally we want to train them when it gets to the point where like, Hey man, they're not going to kill us. Right. At least now, <laughs> you know, yeah. they're not going to try and kill us now, but we can support them and slowly step back and see how they're working, you know, and they can, they can start to build that up. Yeah. Some teams you work with or some, you know, foreign military units, 
they're just not going to be capable of that, mm -hmm. right? Other ones will be, you know, and, and that's good. So it runs, this, there's a spectrum there. Were what you, were they like? Like, did oh they seem, God. were they, uh, <clears throat> did they seem like engaged and like taking initiative and wanting to get better or, or nah. like? <laughs> yes and no. I've like, heard stories yeah. both ways, so I'm just curious what your experience. We look was. at it like this: like the guys we were working with on that trip uh -huh. were they were just infantry guys, you uh -huh. know, in the Iraqi army. The same as like infantry dudes, you know, like they sham out, they don't want to do work, they're hiding back, you know, but they do their jobs, you know. Mm -hmm. Like when it comes to it, they do their job. Kind of similar to that. Um, I would say this: they're hilarious. They're just like us, you know. When we're trying to like be this and that, and finally be like, "Hey, man, if you guys do this right, I'm gonna go get a bunch of you know, blonde, big titty women to come out here," and, and they're just like, "Well, yeah." It's like, "Oh my god, they're just like us, dude." <laughs> like they're they're funny. They're just like we are in a lot of ways, you yeah. know. Other ways, they are not right, and that's gotcha. you know, there's clear differences there. But you can relate to them just like you can. You know, I can relate to you either or whatever. Yeah. Right. Um, there's some similarities. Like they're still just people. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Sure. So we speak a little bit of the language. We had interpreters, you know, um, but they're cool. Are but you? they're just they're privates, you know, like mm -hmm. they have a sergeant, you know, or the, the 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 officer, the lieutenant or whatever, a captain around there. But you know, they're Yeah. Yeah. It are is you, what it is. Are you living with these guys full time or are you just stepping into a room and talking about what you're going to go do. And then you step off and come back and don't see him for, you know, the next 12 hours. So that trip, we had our own compound and then they were just across the way. Okay. So they lived across the way and then they would come over to us and then we train and hang out and do all that. And they go back there. And sometimes we go over there with them and hang out and eat, you know, or drink chai and, you know, bullshit and listen to weird music and laugh, you know, <laughs> but you know, hang out, but like, yeah. So we didn't live in the same buildings on that trip, but yeah. So, but sometimes when we did go out, we'd go out um, for maybe a week at a time, you know, cruising around, doing stuff, and we'd stay with them, you know. But it was pretty cool. One time, we, we slept in like one of Saddam's old like prisons or something, mm -hmm. or like pal someone's a palace, like mm, shitty palace. This is a prison, dude. <laughs> like I remember we're sleeping, and they're like, "Oh, you guys can stay up here." It was some of us and them, and then some other people. And we're up there, and uh, all of a sudden I hear, "What? What?" I was like, "What was that?" We're like sleeping on cots, and the guy's like, "Dude, something just fell on me, bro." I'm like. I'm like, I don't like the way this sounds. No, mm -mm. Oh. no. So I'm up. Come find out, a scorpions were like in the ceiling, no. falling down on top where people were sleeping. Oh. Were you guys just like? <laughs> <laughs> we we ran out of that room so fast, like <laughs> all credibility lost, right? Like just, I'm pretty sure I schooled like a girl, and we like we slept on the roof, right? Yeah. Which is even better because like you're sleeping outside, you know, stars and yeah. everything. Uh, but I was, oh, God damn, that creeped me oh, out. Like, yeah, yeah, I remember he was like, he was like, huh, 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 there's a scorpion. It was oh. like people didn't even know questions, just bolted out of the room. No one's right? like, anymore. You're on your own, bud. Like, yes. Godspeed, you know. Like, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so that was good. But wow, yeah, we had a good time. Yeah. So 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 basically, you know, don't let the enemy find out about the psychological effects of scorpions, <laughs> scorpions oh God, falling no, no. on you. <laughs> Ooh, fuck, fuck no. Scorpions and spiders. Mm -mm. In, in no, what, sir. In what way were those guys like discernibly different from you all? Um, I mean, there's, there's cultural differences. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. But like, so there's some other things too that would make us be like, what? You know, that's unacceptable, right? Like, yeah. You said there was a one word we can't say, and that's actually part of that, the, right? We, we can, we can just right, not I'll, say I'll, it. As long as I don't use that word, right? Yeah, so, like, we can always, we can always, you know, yeah. silence it. So, yeah. Okay. So, there's a, so we're working with these dudes, and one day we're like, hey, man, where, where's Hamsa? And they're like giggling. <laughs> well, I didn't even realize it, but I guess Hamsa is like a nickname. So, if you look at Hamsa, is the number five in Arabic. And if you look at it, like when you write it out, it's a circle. Okay. Mm. Gotcha. Oh, okay. All right. Yeah. Okay. And like, where's Hamsa? And they're like, hey, hey, yeah, high fiving and notes. That was his nickname. Yeah. And they're like, oh, he's a little sore today. He's not going to be in. I'm like, <laughs> what? Then I see Hamsa a couple of days later scratching his butt, being like, oh, you guys. I'm like, wait a second. No. Y'all have a dude that y'all just, boop, boop, you know, like, yeah. When y'all on, the, like, on the team? In their like little platoon, oh, and like 
That poor guy. I'm like, what? And our interpreters are like, yep. They go, this is a, a cultural difference. I was like, cultural difference? That's, <laughs> that's messed up, man. And, uh, that's a cultural difference. Yeah, that's a, that's a big cultural difference. You <laughs> yeah. know? And then, you know, in Afghanistan, that they have stuff like that too, which we just, we're like, screw that, dude. We don't tolerate this shit. Yeah. Like, yeah. uh-uh. Um, so we put shut a, that down. Oh, well, it's kind of hard to when they're all living together and, and Homs is giggling about it. I'm like, I wonder why I never heard of Homs a fart, you know? Like, like <laughs> kind of makes sense. Um, but like, yeah, just it's like a dog coughing, <laughs> you know? Like, <laughs> oh my God. Nah, that's probably too far. But like, I, I, what, if, what the hell are we going to do about that? Yeah. And we're like, dude, that's fucked up. And like, like, hey, man, you're not the first Americans to be pissed off about this stuff and whatever. Right, like, yeah. And Homs is like, I've, whatever, dude. Like, just, I, it just, Homs is not and that really it. changed. Like, don't ever forget, like, when I, when I said, like, they're just like us. And then I remember that being like, they ain't just like us. Mm-hmm. But there is aspects where they, there's some, there's some stuff, right? There's some cross cultural, like, they're into some of the same things. I'm like, well, why are you guys talking about, you know, hot women and the stuff and, you know, Russian chicks when you're, you know, mm-hmm, you know, over to yeah. Hamsa? Oh, whatever, dude. dude. So that was, that was a little weird. Um, and there's other stories about that. There's some books where they talk about that a lot, uh, especially in Afghanistan. That's some big issues with that. Um, gotcha. Some agencies and some special operations units training guys, and that was a that was a big deal. Like that was a hard thing to deal with, you know. Yeah. And then take these guys out on missions, but sure. that's that's something that goes on over there, and you know, that's just not quite the same here. Yeah. So, yeah. So I'm sure there's a lot of people who have watched like us, you know, TV shows like SEAL Team, and oh, yeah. we kind of get a little bit of a cultural feel reading books or watching movies on you could call them tier one units high-end units Mm -hmm. uh when they're not on deployment what are green berets like what's the cultural feel for you guys when you guys are not you know uh deployed well it kind of depends like so if you look at the different units out there and i'm not i wasn't a navy seal i wasn't in delta i wasn't dev group guy i wasn't marine wasn't any of that right i worked with some of those people and know them um but just speaking from sf right um which is actually funny uh we had a seal in my company he was a navy seal and then he got out and then joined green beret then he became a doctor i was like no one's ever gonna believe you like no one will ever believe your resume he'll be like yeah i know like such wow. a cool dude. And he's a doctor, went to University of Minnesota on a Pat Tillman scholarship. <laughs> now he's a full doctor. I'm like, what are you gonna be next? An astronaut? You know? Yeah. Like, uh-huh. So I asked him, he's like, and I was like, what was the SEAL teams like versus here? He's like, it's the same. He has the same personality types, same dudes, culturally a little bit different, you know, because of funding and just how you go about doing things. Same guys. Um, but like off the team, SF is a is a very different unit, right? Because we have a lot more. I'm, I'm a stereo. I can be a, a bit of a stereotype 18 Bravo, right? Like knuckle drag. Yeah, bro. Like whatever. Right. <laughs> like, and then you got like every MOS has its own stereotype. Like the Charlies, they organize things really well. They're always taking inventory. They like explosives. They're a bit dull and they carry heavy things. Right. Like that's our 18 Charlies, 18 Deltas nerds, right? They're the medics. Right. And then the echoes nerds. Cause they're the combo guys. Right. Like great dudes. I'm not me wrong, but you just get a different feel, but You'll see a lot of guys. So, like, I've had guys on my team. Let's take Aaron, mm-hmm. right? Yeah. Aaron's a wildland firefighter now. He's a smoke jumper, I think, really? in Montana. Wow. Yeah, that's Wait, what so he they moved. Yeah, they're they not- moved. Yep. Oh. I felt really bad. I don't know if you'll ever hear this podcast, but I felt really bad because when he was moving, I was out of town. And he asked me to come help him move because he, oh, he has you, horses and everything. piece of crap. How and dare you? I know. I know. I, <laughs> I didn't have to be gone, but I was like, oh, I'm actually kind of out of town. Yeah. But I could have come back for it, but I didn't. So yeah. sorry, Aaron. Um, so he's fighting wildfires. Yeah. I think he's like a smoke jumper up there in Montana. Dude, wow. but you got to have him come visit. Yeah. He should and we'll have him on the pod. Yeah, yeah. He'd be a, yeah. So he's a really interesting guy. He looks, you know how he looks. He looks oh, like your stereotype skinny cowboy. You would never. But he was a cowboy before. Oh, I didn't he, know he literally was drove cattle. I didn't know. And that. he was a guide in Montana. He did all this stuff. Then he was a Marine. And then he joined the Army BSF. Now he's a smoke jumper. He raised horses and like did horse stuff the whole time he was in SF. Him and his wife are probably the best parents I have ever ever met they're amazing his kids are some of the best kids i have ever met but if you met aaron walking down the street you'd be like that guy's not a green beret you never know that skinny dude big adam's apple red skin Uh doesn't eat it looks like he's fucking anorexic Uh he performed dude that guy could just do it but he's like hey man always smiling always joking like you got guys like that 
Then you have the the rest of the RBF, like, you know, whatever. Uh, and then you just have all kinds. Like, I know guys that were very, very religious. Uh, we had one dude. So Nick was a guy on my team for a little bit. He came from another team. Very religious guy. Very centered. Very present. Very focused. Phenomenal, like, husband and father. Like, I remember I went over his house one day to pick something up. And just hanging out with him, I was like, I have a whole different viewpoint of you, man. Mm-hmm. Like, I'm, you're an amazing human being. And then we got guys like, um, this one dude, uh, he went on a high speed chase and got in a shootout, you know, in a hotel and ended up getting killed by the cops. Right. Like, so we have that, you know, but then he got Minaj, right. This dude, Indian guy, he graduated from Princeton, like top, whatever percent. Everyone thought he was an interpreter in Afghanistan. Like he's a green beret, bro. Did not look like it. Spoke fluent Farsi, Pashto. Arabic, like English, whatever. And then he went to go get his master's at like Dartmouth and Penn's like Wharton School of Business, some weird double MBA program you can do. I'm like, yeah, he's a genius. Uh So you've got that. You've got your skater type guys. You got guys that was like, what'd you do before? Like, oh, he's kind of a bum. You know, like it doesn't Uh matter. We have such a broad spectrum of guys, which is super cool. So you get exposed to all these different personality types, right? Um, And that's where kind of where they all meet. So you learn really quickly. You show up to a team like, not everybody's like you. Mm-hmm. That's okay. What matters is, can you do your job? You know, and that was probably something I had to learn a little bit because I had my my mind what it should be. I had to learn very quickly that, hey man, that shit doesn't matter. Like, how do they do their job? These guys are all assets in different ways. Because like this, like that guy, I, I always called him Fred. I, to this day, I, I have to think of his real name. I just called him Fred the whole time. Those are just call sign too. Um, he was not your typical guy. You put him in a room with anybody. In 10 minutes, they, he could do anything he wanted. They'd give him anything he wants, do anything he want. They'd invite him to his house. Like, yeah, man, here's my credit. Like, it's, it's crazy, right? Wow. He was also really good tactically, and he'd get out there and fight too, but he was just that kind of dude. Mm-hmm. You need guys like that. You need guys like that, and then you need your meatheads, you know, mm-hmm. and, and, all, and all of it. So there's a spectrum. So I think that was really cool seeing that uh, in the unit in fifth group. So as you guys know, Drew and I started Dirty Civilian this year. And along with that, we took a lot of financial risks. Our, our families and everyone that has been working with us has been investing into this company. And so far, it's going really well. That being said, we and honestly, everyone else in America are taking a pretty serious financial risk by leaving all of their capital in the American banks and in the American dollar. Inflation is growing worse and worse every day. And it's something that we have to pay attention to. So here's an option for you. When it comes to protecting your IRA or 401k, trust the best. That's why my friends at Allegiance Gold have the highest ratings in the precious metals industry. They have a five-star rating with Trustlink, a triple A rating with the Business Consumer Allegiance, and an A-plus rating with the Better Business Bureau. That's pretty impressive. So you guys can get up to $5,000 in free silver on a qualifying purchase when you visit Protect with dc.com. Another option is you can give them a phone call at 844-790-9191. You guys don't want to wait on this. You should be investing and diversifying some of your assets. So again, call 844-790-9191 and speak to one of their experts. Again, time is of the essence for all of us. Protect your future with Allegiance Gold. Visit protectwithdc.com or call 844 790 Nine one nine one. So, at some point during that uh, that workup and and deploying, you went from being a new guy to to being on the team. And was there a, was there a kind of a period where you felt like, okay, I belong here now, and I'm no longer the new guy? Or is that really gradual? It's really gradual. I would say it takes you about three years, two to three years, oh, to man. start figuring things out and to feel comfortable. Um, once because so on the team, like I was a Bravo, so I was a weapons guy. So I started as the junior Bravo. And then when your senior moves out, then you become the senior Bravo. Then you get a junior, right? And a guy comes in behind you. And then you can keep progressing. And sometimes guys go to other teams or they do different jobs or they go to different specialty companies. But I would say probably, um, honestly, my first deployment, I just shut up and was like, just whatever I can think to do. And I'm just trying to do the right thing all the time, right? Like I'm, I'm learning a lot here because we had some incredibly experienced guys on that team. A lot of good guys to learn from. Uh, the second deployment to Iraq was, I felt a little more comfortable, you know, but I still got some stuff to learn, but now I'm starting to, because my senior became the Fox. So I became the senior. We got another guy that is junior. Um, 
so that was, you know, I still felt like a new guy, but I'm just new as a senior guy. Um, but honestly, it probably took me three years before I was like, okay, I feel solidified on this team. And I feel like I have a general idea of what's going on. And I feel like I can, you know, assert myself a little more. And I feel like the, the, the guys above me, like the guy who became team starting after that was Doug. Was such a good dude. If anybody knows, I'm going to say his name, Doug Young. He lives in Richmond, Virginia. His wife's name is Ruta. If you see that motherfucker, please buy him a beer or take him fishing, right? Like, <laughs> we miss Doug. And that asshole didn't even tell us he was leaving with some of the other teammates. Mm -hmm. We wanted to have, like, a big thing with him. Uh, but we miss him a lot. He was a phenomenal, phenomenal person that I got to learn from. Wow. Really grateful. I was – he was the – became the team sergeant, and I got to learn from him over the span of several years. Uh there were a lot of moments where he was shaking his head. He was like, you idiot. I'm like, I know. I'm so sorry, Doug. <laughs> but that was getting like little trouble, you know, where he's just like, God dang it. What'd you do now? I'm like, yeah. it's not that big a deal. Um, but yeah, I would say probably that many years. Um, it just takes a while. It's gradual. And there's always something, you know, and you think you got it figured out and then you find out, oh, you're really not that good. Or there's a better way to do that, you know, or. No, we did practice that a little bit more. Um, no, you don't know, you know, your, your ranger handbook and your small unit tactics as well as you think you did. Um, you know, stuff like that. So you're just constantly, you know, it's a steep learning curve, I think. So, so. Well, <clears throat> go ahead. Well, so during, during all of your deployments, uh, to reiterate, yeah. Green Berets are also, you guys are not only deploying and doing work on your own, you're also responsible. Is it every deployment you're trying to, to work up and establish, um, people who live there locally and you're, are you always trying to get those people trained up even further or are there deployments where you're like, yeah, we're not really connecting with those guys as much on this deployment. It depends. Okay. Um, some deployments we did like some deployments. I didn't, I didn't work with anybody, you know, it was just, uh, there was a team of four of us and we we're doing low vis stuff Excuse me. in Afghanistan, like surveillance type stuff, you know, dressing up and all that. Um, other deployments, you know, it was more direct action focused with just us, you know, uh, over in the SIF. And then some deployments, you know, we, it was Afghanistan is different than Iraq, right? Very different environments. Um, it just, it really depends. Like, you know who you got in some areas. And then another deployment to do Iraq, a, a third deployment that I did to Iraq, we worked with their special, is it STS thing, a special tactic service or whatever, or special something serve. Anyway, it's like their elite guys, you know, and they were brought over to America for a while when they were first created and they lived here and trained here. Then they went back and they were vetted. Um, it's like some of their special operations guys. So then we created other stuff and did this, but you're working with them. That's a totally different animal than working with, you know, some privates in a, in a random Iraqi army unit, you know, that just happens to be all that's there in your area and you need them. So it just depends on who you're working with. You know, some guys are like, hey, man, this is good. We're going to get them. Like, we're just trying not to get them killed, you know, like mm -hmm. too much. I'm trying to keep them safe, but they still need to do their job um, and complete the mission. Then other guys are like, all right, this is a little different. We're going we're gonna to get after it a little bit more. And we can trust these guys to do certain things because a little bit smarter, a little more experienced, a little bit older, you know, and, and they just take it more serious. So it just depends, I guess. Mm. Yeah. What's, um, what's going on at home <clears throat> while you're... Uh, like, I know you're married. You have a kid. Yeah. Um, at what point in all of this did you all meet? Is this later on, like multiple deployments in or? I met her. I met my wife after my first deployment when I was in Halo school, actually. Okay. So we're in Arizona. And on the weekends, all the instructors are like, get the hell out of Yuma, Arizona. Go to Phoenix or go to San Diego. And we were like, Phoenix or San Diego? We're like, Dude, let's go to San Diego. Yeah. Like, that sounds way better. So, like, okay. So, it's <laughs> – we actually sent four guys from my team to Halo School. Okay. And, like, so it was supposed to be me, Scott, and Mike, the three new guys. We're all going to Halo School after the first deployment. Well, then we got a brand-new captain who, to this day, is one of the most officers I respect more than anybody else, right? He's a colonel now. Uh, we called it – Bill was his name. Um, believe it that because he's still in, whatever. Um, great dude. Well – my slot got taken away to give to the captain because he's the captain. He needs to be qualified. Like I get it. Right. And I was technically the newest of the other two. They all got there like a week or two weeks before mm -hmm. me. I was like, I was pissed. And he, the captain was like, no, 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 no. Give it to Drew. Let him go. And they were like, no, sir, you have to have it. But we pulled a deal with one of our old teammates that just left. He's working there. So he's like, I'll get you in. So basically he got, I just I sent him on standby. So I show up and they were like, oh, so-and-so, oh, you're not getting in. You're 
I don't know, something, right? Like, you didn't yeah. bring this. He's like, Estel, you're up. So, like, kick some other dude out and put me in. I was like, thank God. Uh, it might have been legitimate, but I, yeah. But one of the guys that was there, like, instructing him, he looked at me, he's just, like, winked, like, you know. Yeah. I was like, thanks, Al, you know. And uh, appreciate it. Yeah. And uh, so all four of us went to Halo School together with a brand new captain. And our teams aren't like, redneck from Cleveland, Texas. Lee, he's like, you break that captain in right, you hear me? We're like... <laughs> Roger that, so, Roger that, Lee. Got it. Yeah. So we go down there. We had this hot rod minivan, like we called it. It was a Dodge <laughs> Caravan. It was shockingly quick. But we went all over that place. We went to bars. We were partying. We got to San Diego for Halloween, and that's actually where we met, well, uh, met my wife. So On Halloween. On Halloween, yeah. What was she dressed up as? I don't fucking remember. Like Little Bo Peep or a maid or something like that. <laughs> Now we know what you're I was into. Getting back, I was getting confused, and she's like, no, I wasn't. I was dressed up like this. I'm like, fuck, babe, I can't remember. All I know is you looked hot. Yeah. Like I can you only looked remember good. your eyes were gorgeous. You had night. beautiful <laughs> eyes. You know, like, that's it. Like, I saw you. I was like, mm-hmm. Yeah, like, yeah. done. Got yeah. it. Like, you look good, girl. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, uh, met yeah. her, and then, uh, yeah, I just kept going back to San Diego every weekend. <laughs> and, like, <laughs> meeting her. It's funny because... She was like, she's a very respectable woman, you mm-hmm. know? And I mean, I, you know. Um, and then she married I, you. I was a little wild. <laughs> yeah. And then I was a little wild. And so I'm thinking like, yeah, I keep going out there and, you know, what up, girl? She's like, uh, no, that that's not how this works. Mm-hmm. Like, I'm like, well, what, what, what do you mean? Like, that's because we're going to, you know, uh-huh. And she's like, mm, no, we're not. Like, Shit. Yeah. Are you, you one sh- of them respectable ladies? You should have told her about all your great uh, quality traits. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you mentioned that I, I might have a couple of at the beginning of the episode. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. No, I met her. It's been great. Uh, it's been tough, you know. I mean, all marriages are tough. They all face their problems and their challenges. But we've been working out and getting through it, and we're still here. So, awesome. yeah, I met her out there. And before she knew it, I flew her out there. And you know, we actually got engaged in, uh, in Wales, on a mountain in Wales. That's wow. Awesome. Yeah. So I was doing a course yeah. in England with uh, the Brits and this like surveillance thing. That's really fun. And uh, at the end of it, I flew her out and like uh, called her dad, you know, said, Hey, can I marry your daughter? <clears throat> so I got like a, uh, there's Mount Snowden up in Wales. I got like a little Airbnb. So we spent some time in London. Then went out to Wales, which is way better than London. You ever got a choice? Don't go to London. That place sucks. Dude. Yeah. Like if you like New York city, then you'll probably like London. I don't like either. Like yeah. go outside of London. Uh, but we went out there and we hiked up the mountain, you know, it was like piss and rain storming. Mm-hmm. I was like, here's a story for the ages, you know, like how many people <laughs> got engaged on a mountain yeah. in Wales. It was like top that to all your friends. Right. Yeah. So that was cool. But That's yeah. awesome. Yeah, man. Wow. Okay. So you're, you meet her after your first deployment. Yeah. Did you guys get married like right off the bat or? Uh, I mean, it was quick, but like we were together for like six months. I think before I asked her and then we got the courthouse wedding and then we had a real wedding after for like the families and shit. And then yeah, we got married in like 2000. Oh God, when did we get married? <laughs> that's, the way every that say that. that's every guy. Yeah, yeah it is. Just, like, we had the wedding. For, I, you know, and the she families. was like, she honestly wouldn't have cared if we had that. I was like, look, all our families are going to be pissed if we don't do this. Just yeah. we're doing it for them. Just fucking knock it out. Yeah. Right. Like let them do it um, and get pictures, whatever. <laughs> um, but Yeah. <laughs> So that was 2010 when I think we got married, yeah. I believe. Okay. Um, gotcha. Yeah. So what was your second deployment like? Wait, hold on. How <clears throat> many deployments did you go on? Uh, I only did like seven, but like five of them. Well, two of them, aren't real, like two of them aren't real deployments. So like J-sets, right? So like that's just like a training thing. So I went to Jordan, right? We trained uh-huh. their guys and worked with the Jordanians for a couple months. Um, and then another one, I was, it's not really a deployment or either. I was kind of working by myself in Turkey, like for some government stuff, setting up and working for like everything that happened in Syria right mm-hmm. before it kicked off. Um, and then before that it was three Iraq, two Afghanistan. So those are like the real deployments. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like those were good. Like those were experienced. The other ones was like, bro, like you're not really carrying a gun or really doing anything fun, you know, but it's cool, but it's gotcha. not really a. Cons- I guess you could call it a deployment, but yeah. a non-combat one. Okay. So so what was your second one like? Or how, how different <clears throat> was that from your first? Um, Similar, but that was around the time. The second one was to 
Iraq. And that's when like Operation New Dawn happened, where it's like the drawdown in Iraq. So they don't mm. want stuff happening. Do we still get out the door a little bit? Yeah, we got out the door, did some stuff here and there, um, got some experience. But the tempo was a little slower. It was a lot more working with the Kurds mm. and the Iraqis and trying to get them to not kill each other. Mm. That was a big deal, right? Because yeah. they were like, oh, civil war with the Kurds and Iraqis. We're like, dude, the Kurds would destroy them. You know what I mean? Like, mm -hmm. anyway, it would be bad for everybody. So, <laughs> so it would be like a clearing operation with them. And we go to this village and like, we have Kurds and we have Iraqis. Like, y'all are going to be friends. And they're like, nope, we're not. <laughs> And we're like, no, listen, dumbasses, you have to like play nice together. And like the fuck we do. And so, uh, in, in Arabic, Kurd is like how you say the word monkey. So they always refer to the Kurdish, uh -huh. like it's like a slightly different pronunciation, I think, mm -hmm. but like Kurdi is like monkey. So they're like, oh, the monkeys, but they, they change this one little sound and the Kurdish is like, that's not how you say it, you know, mm, like yeah. mad, but, uh, we pull up, we're doing this clearing operation and, we're having them set up the trucks and everything. And I remember I go over here talking. I turn back around. Kurdish trucks are on one side, Iraqi trucks on the other, and they're all pointing their guns at each other, <laughs> right at each other. And we're like, God oh, dang it. Like, dude, point the guns out there, not at each other. Like, no, them first. It was like children. You're like, yes. come on, guys. You know, and like, I get it. They don't like each other for good reason. So. But that was kind of funny. Why did they not like each other? Uh, it goes back to what Saddam did to the Kurds. There's a lot there. And the Kurds have just been shit on their entire existence, right? Mm -hmm. By everybody. In, you know what I mean? Um, you know, they got their pros and cons, but they're kind of a divided people between different political parties, um, which I can't even remember. There's like YPG and YPK or something like that. And there's some other stuff. Um, but there's, yeah, they've always been kind of shit on by the Arabs, you know? Yep. Um which is funny because when you go to Iraq, the nicest place in Iraq is beautiful, clean roads, nice restaurants. It's all in the Kurdish areas. Really? It's, it's gorgeous up oh, there, dude. Like wow. I would go on vacation there. Like there were some, I got pictures. It's the most beautiful thing I've ever seen. Wow. Like hotels were staying at. I mean, not like super nice hotels, but they're sure. clean. Yeah. They got good food and the people are super nice. Wow. You know, like it's a little bit different. Yes. You know, there's no trash rolling down the roads for the most part. You know, mm -hmm. um, it's just different. So... It's funny because a lot of the bad guys in Iraq, they, they live up in Kurdistan, like terrorists. <laughs> and they're like, nice. they relax up there, and then they go back down. There's yeah. like some, there's some stuff going on with that but, huh. uh, from what I've been told. So gotcha. it's interesting. So while you've been there and continuing to deploy, do you kind of, do you take on more of a leadership role as you grow? Or are you, are you still doing weapons <clears throat> sergeant or weapons? Yeah. At this time, I'm the, still, I'm the senior brother. I'm still a weapons guy. Okay. Um, I'd say a really defining part of my career was when I became the Fox. So like maybe a month before we deployed to Afghanistan for the first time, uh, we know what we're doing. We're going to this one place. This one VSO village stability operations or VSP village stability platform. So we have a base, right? We're taking over for another fifth group team that basically built it. And then we're going to go in there and then we're going to work out of this. And then we've got to figure this whole area out, which, cause people haven't been there for years. Right. Um, so it's kind of a black hole for information. <clears throat> so about, Maybe a month before we deployed, uh, I think it was in, we deployed that time in January again, I think, or February. It was sometime around Christmas, I think. <clears throat> Our 18 Fox, uh, Chad, unfortunately, he had to stay back. He couldn't go on the trip. Some personal things happened, you know, it sucked. Um, fair enough, man. Um, got it. So I remember Doug called me. He's like, hey, man, I'm going to make you the Fox. I was like, uh, what? Like, you sure about that? He's like, yep, you're the Fox. I was like. If, you, if you'll do it, I was like, I mean, you tell me to do it. I'll do it. Like you, anything you ask me to do, I'm going to do. Um, like, you know what you're getting, right? He's like, yep. <laughs> Unfortunately, you know, like joking around. So I became the Fox and that was a really, um, I didn't go to the, sc the school to be the Fox. I didn't go to the 18 Fox course. I was an E6. Uh, usually that's an E7 job. I was still an E6. So I played the acting Fox and that was a great time. And I learned, well, like when I said, Doug, like that, that deployment was a big one. Like I still have a picture. Like people say, like, think of the happiest moment of your life. Like someone said that, you know, it's like one of these bullshit therapy things you go yeah. to. And I'm like, Jesus Christ, like, whatever. He's like, I just want you to think of the happiest moment. I was like, <laughs> they're like, what is that for you? And they're like, I'm like, what? I'm like, oh, yeah, it's this time uh, on the side of in Afghanistan where me and Doug are standing on the side of like a cliff kind of thing. I don't call it quite a mountain, but a like cliff. And he's overlooking this whole like village that sits down in this bowl. And I still have this picture. I was like, 
that's the most peaceful moment, I think is the term. The most peaceful moment in my life was that one. So mm. getting to work around Doug, because he was a Fox before, and he kind of taught me what to do. But he said, hey, man, do it your way. Do what you feel is right. I was like, okay. Wow. And it was super yeah. cool, man. I made, some, I made some mistakes. Don't get me wrong. But he let me make those mistakes. And then he counseled me and said, what are you going to do different next time? You know, or Doug wasn't a guy that talks a lot, very reserved. But if he gets mad, you know it. Because it's little subtle things. You know, he purses his little lips and he breathes in deep. He doesn't talk real loud, but he'll just a little bit louder. And it's like, oh shit, dad's mm. mad at us. You know, yeah. like we're in trouble, right? And it, you don't ever want Doug to be disappointed in you. Yeah. So that was a good, that was a good experience, man. I, I think I really grew as a person. I grew as just, a, you know, a team guy, you know, with my team. I grew in responsibility and accountability. Um, because part of my job was making sure everything, everybody knew everything, predict what's going to happen, and saying, hey, man, these areas are areas we got to watch out for. I'm tracking all the activity in this area. I'm building together packages and working with our human people, um, stuff like that. So it was really interesting because your job is to protect the team and prepare them for everything, right, intel-wise. Um, so that was interesting. It was really cool. Um, I was not your typical computer guy, right? Like I was uh, not sitting behind a computer yeah. typing all day. Terrible, right? But I, th I think it did a good job, um, but I learned a lot there. That was mm -hmm. a good one, so. Was that kind of a, a phase where you were forced into self-education? Like, hey, this is a job I'm passionate about and I have to learn this stuff. And so sitting behind a computer, having to put together packages and self-educating on individuals, mm -hmm. probably talking to wherever you're getting your intel from, you're then having to write a report on someone, was that kind of a form of college where you were like, this I can get yes, behind? Yes, it is. And when you say it, it makes me realize that. So we had a few people on that trip because um, at most, the least amount of people we had on our base was 18. The most, I think it was 24. So we only had eight guys in our ODA or eight or nine guys in our, we got the ninth guy, George, our new medic. He flew over. I think he was number nine or number eight. Anyway, we had a small team that time. And we had 10 uh five infantry and five tanker kids from third ID to like support us, right. To give us some more bodies, you know, we're on patrol and help man in towers. Um, and then we had a couple Intel people, which were both officers, which was funny. Cause like it's a captain and a Lieutenant. And they're like, uh, I was in charge of them. I'm like, yeah, you damn right. I am, you know, <laughs> no, uh, they were great. I learned a lot from them, but being able to like, I don't know that stuff. So you're sitting down behind a bike down behind a computer and you're like, all right, I got to figure out what in this is the truth of the information we have. And the fact is we don't have any information on Archie district in Afghanistan. The other team was focused on the district to the West, right? And that was new. And then we're pushing in over here. I'm like, okay, cool. Um, so we're building all that. So we got to figure out and sift through it and go, Hey man, this is, we don't know, or this is something we do know. So we're building that information. So as our human guys and Mike was one of them, he's, he's kind of in charge of that. He's gathering this information and bringing it back to me and we're going over it. And I'm like, okay, cool. Well, here's some things that I need to know. And, and this is, these are some gaps, right? Or can they confirm this or, or whatnot? We just got to get a feel for that area. Um, that was super interesting. Mm -hmm. So by doing all that and then having to formulate thoughts, you know, not formulate thoughts, but take that information and then put it in a digestible way for a bunch of green berets who honestly, you have five minutes max before you lose their attention. Right. Like I can't sit here and be like, uh, guys, technically the, uh, you know, cultural differences between these people and these people and this tribe has desensitized them to the overall, you know, like they're going to be like, shut up nerd. Like, tell us what we need to know. It's like, Hey man, these guys, this, you know, so you got to put it in it. You got to package it in a way that's digestible for them and gives them exactly what they need to know. Um, and every time we go out, it's like, Hey man, same, same, same. Here's something new. We're going to be looking out here. Historically, we're tracking every IED in the area. And there was a small amount of a short period of time there uh, during that deployment, which is about nine months that we were encountering an IED like every three days, you know, um, they were putting them out. We weren't hitting them. Thank God. We actually, I would get the, some of the information back from people back at the, uh, the AOB that were listening and doing all this other stuff. And they said, you guys know that at this point you've driven over seven IEDs that didn't go off. Oh, and goodness. yeah, like, and I'm reading the reports like they're comms traffic <clears throat> and they're talking. They're like, they go, the beard, the, the beard guys, this, this truck with the thing on it. We're like, well, that was this truck. And Logan was in that truck and Scott or whoever. Okay. And they're like, they're arguing over radios. Like I'm hitting the button and it's not working. It's not working. So then they went to command wire 
you know, instead of like remotes, because we had jammers and stuff. So they go to command wire. Some other command wire ones didn't go off. He's like, I'm doing it. I'm doing it. He's like, you're not doing it right. Take the battery and touch the wires like this. And he's like, I'm doing that. And we're just walking around, like doing our wow. shit. Like trucks wow. are driving over these IDs. It was like, and by the end of the point, we count seven. And I was like, oh. That's a lot. That's yeah. wild. Yeah. Thank you, Jesus. So, you know, so. Yeah. we had uh, Remy Adelecki on previously, and he explained yeah. a little bit of what yeah. human is. Can you explain... Um, what percentage were you intaking intel from signal intelligence versus human intelligence? And then kind of like, how does that information get collected? And then like when you're reading it, and obviously you can probably only explain so much, but yeah. um, what percentages are you actually taking from each of those? And also, are you in charge of saying, hey, I need someone to go actually make a human conversation with so-and-so to gather more information. Are you in charge of that? Or is that someone else that's just providing to you a stack of papers or a PDF of like, here's everything that we have? The way we did it and the way we do things may not be the way other people do things. So on that trip, when I was the Intel Sergeant, I know our gaps and I'm talking to our guy that runs all that stuff, the human. I'm not going in. I don't, I don't like meeting with people. I don't want to talk to you. I don't want to get your shit. I don't want to play these fucking games. I don't like it, right? I am not a human guy. They, everybody on the team knew. They're like, yeah, Drew's the last person you should put in a meeting, right? I've done it, but only because I had to. Um, we had a guy that was really good at it. So he knows. Like, he has his own level of autonomy where he's going to go and do what he thinks is right. But we're talking. So he knows what the team needs. He knows what I think. He knows what I'm trying to figure out, but he's also like, he sees way more. So he's going to keep that in mind, but he's going to get everything he can get. Right. Um, so he has his network and, you know, the people he talks to, and we did some really cool stuff with that. But the thing with human intelligence is <clears throat> it's human. That's the problem with it. Right. So you have to validate that information, I guess you could say. We have to, you know, the veracity of it. There's always words, right? And again, I'm the last guy to talk to you about it. Like I learned it was like, pfft, dump that stupid shit. So, but it is very valuable. Um, so he would decide like, hey, we have to dual source stuff, right? And once you do that, you can basically say, well, now I can take this as it's somewhat credible. If I can confirm it with something else. Uh, but you can't ever take anything off single source, which is basically, if you look like, what, what is single source? Dude, read any online magazine or the news. Like they don't validate shit. You know, the only guy who does is Matt Taibbi, right? Like that guy. There's very few journalists like that anymore. Um, these people are just grabbing one piece of info and be like, it's like this. And they're like, actually, I was wrong. Sorry. And they post something later. It's like, yeah, dude, you talked to one person. Yeah. So he's got to do all that. And I got to take it. And we just, we're constantly feeding each other back and forth. But you can't just take... Anytime we've ever done anything with only like signal stuff, you know, because you can Google what sign SIGINT is, signals intelligence. Anytime we've done something like that, there's always cons to it. It's not perfect. Human, there's always cons. It's not perfect. So ideally, they, they support each other, you know, in an ideal world. But sometimes you don't have that. Sometimes you got one or the other. But you're always trying to get as, as clear of a picture as you can. Mm. So again, I'm sure there's people out there that are going to be like, that's not exactly. Yeah, I know, man. I don't like it. I don't, I'm not, you know what I mean? I'm not that kind of person, sure. but yeah. it is what I did for a little bit. Sure. So. so that was your third deployment? We were on second, Ish. I think. That was uh, third, yeah. Oh, that, so there's two it. Iraq and there was Afghanistan and then there was another Afghanistan, then another Iraq. So, okay. okay. So your first couple of deployments, um, uh, were, I know we've kind of done some broad strokes over them. Were you guys actually like doing the DA missions that everyone like hears about the, you know, where you're actually going and you're taking someone down. Yeah. Yeah. We did some of that. I mean, did we do as much of it as, you know, like other guys were going out every night and hitting four five, six, seven buildings and targets and follow on. No, we weren't right. It just wasn't our area, but we'd build target packets. You know, we train up on it and we'd, we'd go after somebody if that led us somewhere else. We'd go do that too. Um, was our op tempo in that regards as high as say like, you know, somebody that's all they do, you know, say mm -hmm. like, you know, CAG, you know, like the Del those guys or like, you know, the dev group guys or whoever, um, or our SIF teams at the time, you know, especially in certain years during that Iraq war. No, it wasn't. Um, did we go out and do those things? Yes, we did. Um, would we like to do them more? Of course. Yeah. So would those guys, like you just always want to go do that, right? It's, it's awesome. But I think for me, like, you can be 
the coolest special operations guy in the world. Um, but there's always some 18 year old kid who is an infantry guy that was not prepared for it or not an infantry guy, you know, like that got, those were the cards he was dealt. He got put at fob, you know, Keating or, you know, in the, you know, one of those valleys like where Restrepo was or mm -hmm. something like that. And that's their experience. So no matter how cool you think you are or how much you've done, there's usually some kid out there who's done just as much or had a, a different experience. And maybe that's not exactly what they were expecting, but, but that's what they had. You know, it's kind of the cards you get dealt and a little bit's luck of the draw where you go and a lot of that stuff. But yeah, we did that stuff. It was, it was good. Gotcha. Um, we would have liked to have done more, but yeah. we did do some, some good things and, and had a good time with it. So. Were, were there some memorable experiences uh, that stick out to you or ones <clears throat> that you felt like, like kind of pulled you together as a team more or anything <clears throat> like that? Uh, yeah. You know, like that Afghanistan trip in 2012 was a really good one. Um, there were also some times in Iraq. Uh, so there was one time I got knocked silly. Uh, so <laughs> we, we're, we're doing this mission where we know basically we're going after and we're hitting this house, right? We're going off this person. Fair enough. No target. So I'm on the, the gun, right? I'm on the truck that's covering the front gate and on the second story. And our team's coming up. We secure the area. And our team, and I'll never forget because it was Logan and Mike, right? Mike guy kind of came to the team with at the same time. He's a good dude. He's off doing great things in, in other units now. Um, and then Logan, uh, he, went, he got out and went to the National Guard. Uh, but he was my junior at the time. And I was on the gun. And I'm like, oh, cool. So pull up at a 50 cal point this way. And then I got my saw out, you know, at night vision. I'm covering the second story. And I'm like, okay, these guys are going to breach the gate, right? They're going to they're gonna tell me that they're going to breach the gate, right? <laughs> so I'm like, something's taking too long. And so I look down and look over at the, the metal gate, like in the courtyard, I'm like, whatever. And I look down and they're all stacked up. Oh, Mike, and there's Mike, there's Logan, there's the Iraqis. I'm like, cool. And all of a sudden I just see Logan like this. And I see him turn and check. And I see that quarter turn on the initiator. And I'm like, <gasps> dude, like you got to tell us that shit. Cause I'm like right here. And right as I pull that gun up and start to go down, that goes off, that charge, right? <laughs> and they didn't, like, communicate that over the radio. That was a screw-up, right? Yeah. They probably should have told us, right? Because especially because Doug, our team sergeant, the captain, they're on outer security, and they just hear this giant boom. Mm -hmm. And that, that charge was <laughs> made by Logan, who's a Bravo, who's not the engineer demo guy on the team. So what did he do? He was like, hey, hey how much charge do we need for this? Logan's like, ha, P for plenty. That's my math, right? <laughs> so he made this charge that just, so when the, the charge went off, I was going down in the turret trying to like get back a little bit, you know, from the mm -hmm. blast. And it went off right as I was coming down, right like in the opening of the hatch. So it went off and it snapped my head back. My head cracked off the turret in that hole. <sighs> Nods messed up. And I came down the gun, like the saw hit me in the face as I was going down, <sighs> knocked me out for like a few seconds. You know, and they're like, oh, shit. They're like, oh, God. They're like One of the kids, the guys like driving, like, oh, God, Drew's dead. You know, I'm like, I'm not a. So I'm like, oh, you know, like come up like, what? You know, just concussed. You yeah. know, so I jumped back up and I'm like kind of woozy. It didn't just blow the gate open. It flattened the entire metal like framing and ripped it out of the courtyard. Blew every window on the house out. Glass everywhere. Whole thing smoky. Iraqis are like, oh, you know, like they're all messed up. And like all of a sudden I see this, people just start walking out of the house, like stumbling out. Fuck it. I quit. <laughs> Hands up, like coughing, like stumbling. There wasn't shit to clear. And everybody's just walking like, oh yeah, we get it. Come here. You know, I have a seat. And it was like the whole thing changed. And like Doug's pissed. He's like, what the hell? You know? Yeah. And he's like, what would, he thought it was a, you know, like a houseborn ID. Like uh -huh. we got blown up, you know, something like that. Something bad just happened. It was that you know, big. So he's rushing over. He's like, real, you know, hey, what happened? You know, report in. And I'm going, like, oh, Logan blew the gate. You know, like, or one of the guys blew the gate. And Logan's gig is like, yeah, that was a big old charge. I was like, fuck you. <laughs> like that one, you didn't tell me. That was really big. My ears are ringing. I can't see straight, you know, like. Yeah. I don't know what's going on right now, but I just remember seeing like all the smoke and all these Iraqis just like coughing and like falling to their knees, like, <laughs> you know, glass everywhere. All the windows are blown out of this house. Dude. Right? There's like metal bars they have. And I remember seeing that and people were just walking out like, mm -mm, no, sir, like, we're done. 
Like, and there was nothing like really clear after that. It was kind of dumb. So that was pretty funny. But I got a concussion on that one pretty good. Good uh, gosh. That was hilarious. So lessons learned. Oh, yeah. And that gun hit. I just remember like, boom, like that, you know, like hitting that. I remember this like smack, like right in my face. And that was a saw hitting me in the gosh. as I came down. Uh, but it was pretty funny. Yeah. Was funny just after. Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Doug was not happy, man. What? Was he just like, oh, well, mission accomplished. Like, well, he, they're all coming out. He's like, well, I, was, I didn't think that, you know, it was like, bro. <laughs> I mean, ha ha. Yeah. But also. But. <laughs> so, so, and this is, I'm just going to nerd out yeah. for a second. So your nods, yeah. what happened to them? I, I just like, pick them up, put them, like they were all, my helmet was all jacked up. I have them like extra security. I have like the bungees on them. Yeah. I've been tied down also. Were you running 15s or, or uh, 31s? Yeah, oh, PS 15s. Okay. So the dual tubes. Yep. yep. The old school ones. Uh, but yeah. So that was pretty funny. Good God. There's yeah. It was funny after. Sure. N we got yo, we got chewed out pretty good for that one. You know what I mean? Yeah, like, what was the AR? Everybody like? got chewed out for that one. And it was like, I didn't do anything. You like I'm in trouble too. We're all in trouble. We get it. You know? <laughs> like and then we broke that down. Why? You know what I mean? And yeah. and that was a big talk. And you know, we didn't make that mistake again. Like, hey man, you gotta say external breach. You know, like you gotta call that. Uh -huh. You know, so we know if we hear a boom, there's not a bunch of dead people, mm -hmm. you know. Like we know what that boom is, so good that, was, that was funny. Golly. That was a good time. Yes. That was hilarious. I was not happy. No, I'm of course sure I couldn't. Wouldn't. I was just like, they're like Drew, I'm like mm -hmm. they're like Drew, like yellow. You know, like what? Yeah. They're like what are you talking about? Like oh, I don't know. Just give me a minute. You <laughs> know, bell <laughs> rung pretty good. Oh yeah, dude, my head smacked off that thing. Helmet all screwed up. Everything. Just one of many concussions, though. Oh yeah, I had a lot yeah. of concussions. So. Oh boy. Gotcha. So, okay. So your first three, or was so your third one was in Iraq and Afghanistan or Afghanistan? First two were Iraq, third one was Afghanistan. Then we went back to Afghanistan again for like a few months to do like a kind of a low busy kind of thing. What right? was, what was that? Uh, so that was, we were, I was assigned to be an liaison officer for a general. Well, at the same time we had this team there that was guys that I knew from fifth group and they were doing basically like scouting surveillance kind of stuff, right? They're setting things up and doing surveillance, but we had low vis vehicles. We're dressing up and stuff, but we had to go out in the city and, you know, two people per truck, you know, or one or two trucks and, and do stuff in cobble. So that was kind of cool. Okay. So your low vis vehicles, what did you have? <clears throat> like Hiluxes. Oh, you son of They're so cool. God, we so, actually, now I'm jealous. Yeah. It's not all the crazy war stories or like the crazy, just yeah. not, you got in a Hilux. Oh, we had Hilux a long time. Yeah. Then land cruisers, but so with that, ah. it's it's really hard for any white guy to l blend in. So how did you do overseas? It? So we actually learned, and, and if someone went up to the, if we had to, we're we're done, right? Mm -hmm. But we could pass that eyeball test going through checkpoints, and that was as best as we were going to get. So as we were driving through, we were like, well, what can we blend in this? Like. Bro, I look like a Chechen, right? Like foreign oh, fighter. Oh, so yeah. I had my red beard, you know. We had, you know, from the waist up, I, I looked like that. And I had some things to cover up tattoos in case my sleeves came up. We didn't wear sunglasses. You know, you threw the weird box of tissues up on the dash like all the Afghanis have, you know. And like the dumb weird pictures, you know. Or they have like Dostum, you know. or uh, Wait, what's that? that? Dostum. Uh, he was like one of the... Like, watch that movie 12 Strong. He's like one of the yeah. warlords that fought against okay. him. Uh, gotcha. He was one of those guys. So, like, you'll see, like, in people's vehicles, they have uh, Dostum or, oh, my God, the Lion of uh, Major Sharif got. God dang it. What's oh, his yeah. Name? The, the, oh, uh, what's his name? I'm drawing his a He's legend. Yes, that guy. Or they'd uh, have his picture, right? Uh, I'll Google it a minute. For some reason, I'm spacing on it. And he, and he was assassinated. Yep, that guy. That Same whole dude. story yeah. is insane. Yeah. Uh, uh, hey, Jamie, pull that up. I mean, Nick. Pull that it's so up. cool you got a Jamie, uh, like Joe Rogan. We do. Is you got the, a Nick. Is it the line? It's not the line of the pat, the patch tune. Uh, I can't remember, man. It starts, there's a Z in his name. Uh, look up the Northern Alliance leader. Yeah. In That's Afghanistan, That's so bad, right? I can't remember. Or yeah. Or Iraq? Afghanistan. Okay. Uh, so anyway, they'd have like pictures of these guys. So we throw a picture of that up, you know. They also have like weird pictures like babies. You know, like when you go buy a picture yeah. frame, they have like the fake picture uh -huh. in the frame. Yep. They'd have stuff like that, but it was like a baby, right? But it's like a, I have children, I am strong man, like yes. that kind of thing. Yes. So we'd put shit like that around and we'd hide the comms and we'd put trash in the vehicles yeah. and they look pretty convincing. Wow. And we would actually like, we'd pull the check once, they'd just wave us right through and they'd wave us through and they'd stop uh, the other like, you know, foreign like military guys. And then we got by, I remember one guy, he's waving us through, he looked at us, he went, kind of looked funny. And then they're like, that was it. Mm -hmm. I was like, hey man, we're not doing too bad here. Granted, 
<laughs> that's as close, you know, anything more. And they're obviously where they're going to know who we are. Yeah. What, but, what are your clothes? Uh, so underneath I'd wear like a pair of like Merrill running shoes, uh -huh. you know, um, and then jeans and I'd have my war belt on and, and low vis plate carrier. And then over top, I'd throw on like, you know, the man jam top, mm -hmm. right. And like a Packle hat and a big red beard. Mm -hmm. Um, but I'd have it set so you can like see my tattoos, like a nude sleeve in my left arm. Um, what but about, yeah, that was it. What really? about your guns? They were all down below. Okay. So we'd keep them down by the seats where they couldn't see anything. Yeah. But we had the truck set up a certain way. So that was kind of neat. Were we like pros at it? No, there's guys that were way better doing it, but we, we learned a little bit. Yeah. We got decent at it, but we're not getting out of that damn truck. I'll tell you that much. Sure. You know, they're obviously, mm -hmm. um, but we passed the eyeball test a lot. Like people driving next to us would like look at us and some people would look at us and be like, oh shit, I don't want to be near that. Those mm -hmm. look like legit, like bad guys. And then other times they'd look at us and some guys would look closer, you know, and you could kind of tell. So. Gotcha. It just depends on how long they looked at us. So, so it was kind of neat. You were just primarily personal security? No, we were we were setting up things and kind of surveillance-y type stuff, okay. I guess you could say. Gotcha. Yeah. So, I mean, it was – we are probably getting out more than we – we're trying to do more than, you know, probably what we were able to do, but it was interesting. It was a good time. So Did, Nick, you, did you find that guy's name? Is it – Ah Ahmed Masood? Masood. Lion yeah, of, that's the Lion of pa Panchir? Yes. Oh, I was going to say Panchir. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I had Lion, right? I think I said Lion. Yeah. 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 Dude, that's an absolute legend. That's stud. And was, so, uh, probably the greatest hope for that whole place. Oh, I know. And then he was Dead. assassinated three days before 9 11, wasn't it? Something like that. Yeah. Or no, it was after that, wasn't it? I don't, I don't know. I can't remember. We'll I, I got my it. history. Yeah. That'll be a second. Yeah. Jamie will tell us. Nick will tell us. Yeah. Anyway. Yeah, it was cool. So, did you enjoy that uh, more or less than working on a full team and doing DA? Kind just of stuff? different. Um, I, I like the DA stuff. You know, sure. that's that's what I think my mentality is. Um, but yeah, it was fun. It was a different experience. I enjoyed it a lot, and it was cool because I worked with the Brits doing that, like the training thing with the Brits for I think eight or nine weeks. It was a couple months long, doing all that in England, right? And then you know, I told my brought my wife over, and this was kind of the first time. I was like, hey we can start applying some of this stuff. And when it comes to that, the Brits have a special unit. That's all they do. The SRR, the Special Reconnaissance Regiment, you guys can look it up. They are, I mean, we got Americans that are really good at that shit. There's just some about the Brits, like they've been doing it for so long in Northern Ireland. They did it in Iraq. They did it in Afghanistan. And they knew how to apply things in different areas and what they could and couldn't do. They're just really good at it, man. And I learned a lot from them. I'm really grateful I got to go to that school. It's probably one of the coolest, funnest courses I got to do. Mm. So, so so that so you went to that school after your third deployment? Uh, I went to that school before that. Okay, but yeah. oh okay. So tell us about the school. Like what was your experience there? You basically go over there and they just teach you how to do surveillance in a vehicle yeah. on foot. They teach you about body language. They teach you how to fit in. And they're like, you dumb Americans do not fit in anywhere. It's true. <laughs> yeah. Like they're like, you are so obvious. It's ridiculous. <laughs> like, yeah, we know. You know, so like they taught us a lot about that, but they really broke things down and they'd have people come in from like uh, their MI6, right? And teach us some stuff and do case studies. They taught us a lot about what they did in Northern Ireland. Uh, and all the instructors had an unbelievable amount of experience. Really? Like, and then we did tech stuff. So we'd like break into stuff and how to rip computers and cell phones and all this stuff like that. Did we get really good at it? No, but we got the concept down. Uh, but we wow. did, it, every day was surveillance. We're driving with your maps and radios on there. Um, and that that rolls right into that 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 time I got caught. I'm so excited for this. Oh, so just, just for our viewers, just know that I think it was the first time you and I had ever met. And we were at some event. Um, we were, it was NRA conference. Oh, was it? It was NRA conference like seven or eight years ago. Yeah. And uh uh, you were over at the Airbnb that night. That's when we oh, first yeah. met. Yeah. And uh, we we're like, I was like, I like your name. And you're like, I like yours too. And then, you know, <laughs> Great then we, then, yeah, then it was just like, oh, yeah. no. Um, and I heard this story and it is, uh, it has forever been one of my favorite stories. That's not mine. And uh, I know I can't do it justice. I've, okay. I've tried to tell Josh, I've tried to tell him like, oh, God, I got this story that, that Drew told me. And I've, I've totally been that guy where I'm like, I've got a story someone else's story I'd like to tell you. <laughs> um, uh, but I don't remember all the details because yeah. it's been so long. So why don't you take it away? Tell us what you were doing. Okay. And right. this is 
This is great. So no so, shit. There you are. Yeah. No shit. <laughs> so we're working in England with these guys, right? So basically what they do is you drive around in cars and like you have to follow somebody and they teach you that. And then they get out of the car and then you got to get out of the car. So they might get on a bus, right? They might get on a transit system. It doesn't matter. But you got to figure this out. And you have comms on you, like um, kind of like hidden comms, right? Uh, See so where like it's like called an induction loop. So you have an earpiece in and this thing that goes around your neck. All of it gives you terrible cancer, I'm sure, right? <laughs> and then you got like a little push to tuck button in your pocket and you carry your radio. Like I wore like baseball, like sliding shorts and I pulled them up real high, like Urkel, you know? Mm -hmm. And I shoved the radio in like much small on my back, you know, so you couldn't see any of it. So they're basically they're teaching you how to do this. Fair enough. So I'm following this one guy and I'm like, hey, this is whiskey. I'm at blue four two. Who can at blue four four? You know, like, so I'm, I'm looking for somebody else to take over because I've been behind this person for too long. They're like, no, but no one can. No one's chiming in. I'm like, hey, this is so-and-so. Like, hey, whiskey, you're on your own. I'm like, shit. Right? I'm like, all right. Next one. Hey, who can here? Nothing. This day, I don't know if they pulled them back or if those guys were just so far behind they couldn't catch up. Like, wow. I don't know. Uh, but anyway, so I'm like, they go to this residential area. Right? I'm like, cool. So I parked my little ways away, you know, you know, trying to do my best. I'm like, this motherfucker knows I'm here, dude. Like, they totally know I'm here. Like, how could they not? Now, do these people... Are they a part of yes. the training yeah, they're exercise? they're all role players. They're okay. all in, in it. Even the person you're following? The person I'm following. Now, okay. the people around us? No, nah, these are just people going about their day. But, <laughs> like, the person I'm following, yes, they're in it. Okay. And the, my teammates and, you know, everybody else. So I get out, and when this person starts walking through, like, a residential area. And, like, over in England, it's a lot like duplexes, right? Mm -hmm. They don't have, like, yards and shit. It's just, like, you've seen it on TV, yeah. right? So I'm walking down this, like, alley slash street where all the front doors are. And I'm trying to stay behind, like, at a, you know, just one curve around. So I'm just constantly keeping it. I'm just walking around, and I'm, I'm doing little shit to try and find this one place, you know, like, signal-type stuff and run these sensors. And I'm like, push the talk. My push the talk's in my pocket, right, as I'm walking. So I'm like, okay, at this location, go in here, right? And now I don't have any more, like, preset locations. I just have to describe it. Mm -hmm. Start walking around. I see this person that goes around the backside of this, like, uh, community, right, this living area, like, neighborhood or and there's like this pathway around the backside. And there's like fields over here. And I notice, oh shit, people are starting to come outside. And I'm walking around and they're asking me questions. And I'm like, cool. So all these women are coming out with like strollers and other stuff. I'm like, that's a school. School's getting out. Oh. And these moms are all, I'm in the crowd of moms. And I've got my hand, my left hand, in my left pocket pushing a push to talk so so i got it like down here and i'm like doing this like hey this stuff well when you get where you can't talk right you can't talk at a point i'm not the most like uh, what's the term like subtle person right? you don't say I, I, like i'm not i'm not saying i was good at any of this i'm just saying i, I did it and i learned it yeah. and like great course so i'm walking around and like, there comes a point where like, if you can't talk, then you just use your clicker to talk. Yeah. Right. And like, was it like two for yes, one for no or something like mm -hmm. that? Or if you just hit it a bunch of times and be like, clear the net, you know, problem. Something like that. I can't remember. And like, I hit it. I'm like, hey man, I can't talk. There's like women. And so I'm like, they're asking me questions. I'm like pushing this in my pocket. Right. <laughs> and this lady comes up next to me. She's like, <laughs> like looking at my pocket and her. And I'm just like. Doesn't help. I'm wearing these stupid sunglasses. By the way, no one wears fucking sunglasses in England, you idiot. Right? Like, I'm wearing like, I don't know. I look like a sexual predator yes. at the moment. And she's like, all right, what are you doing wrong? And I'm like, ah, oh, shit. And they're like asking me questions. And I'm like, and it kind of clicks a little bit. And it looks like I'm jerking off in my pocket. Yes. Right? And yeah. through my pocket. Looks like I'm playing myself. Yeah, outside of the school. And like these other moms start coming up. And she's like. She like falls back and she's like, oh, right, he's motherfucker right here. Da, da, da. You know, doing all this shit. Yeah. I'm like, Jesus Christ. I'm still trying to watch this dude. <laughs> and these like two ladies get like on each side of me. And I'm sitting there and I'm looking at this one lady. I'm like, and I look over and this lady, she's got a flip phone out. Oh, she's like, oh no. God. Right there. I'm like, mother. <laughs> I don't remember this I'm part. I'm so burned. Right. <laughs> and so I'm like doing this thing in my pocket. I'm like, oh God. Right. 
So all these women are around me and it's like, they're like on the phone, like talking to each other or something. It's like everyone turned against it. As I'm walking, it's like, as I'm walking on this path, it's like, everybody's looking at me like, that's the one. Like that's the one. I'm like, oh my God. Oh God. Oh God. You know, like get me out of here right now. I'm like, all right, we're done. Like I gotta, yeah. They're like, all right, go ahead and get your car whiskey and get back. I'm like, cool. So I go back. Everybody's already there, right? I'm the last guy to come in. And I sit down and I remember those instructors, was it Beanie and this other dude? There's two of them that day. And we get back and he's like, they're like, so what, uh, what's your exposure on you and exposure on the car? Like out of four. I was like, uh, on me four. They were like, if there was a higher number than four, we'd give you that. I'm like, <laughs> God dang it. On the car. I was like four. They were like, okay, well, let me show you this. He pulls out a piece of paper. I got called into the cops and there's a picture of me going like <laughs> in this lady's flip phone. With your hand in your phone. Yeah, pocket. with my hands like right here. And it was like, be on the lookout, potential sexual predator. <laughs> like, this is what he's wearing. Here's what he looks like. Here's the car they were driving. Yeah. I'm like, they go, yeah, the cops saw this and immediately called us. And was like, hey, we think we got one of your guys. I was like, oh my God. So they're always like, what are you doing over there? Every time, like after that, they'll be doing something. They're like, oh, what are you doing in your pocket right there? I'm like, oh, dang it. Because it looks like <laughs> You're oh freaking playing when you're yeah. in your pocket. So I got called in as a sexual predator in England, which was pretty funny. Yeah. Also pretty embarrassing. You know? oh. so, like Gosh. there's like we told the cops it's part of the they're like, okay. So they just like deleted it. Not a big deal. I was like, do I have to worry about this? Like when I'm going out, is someone gonna see this and like call the cops? And they're like, no, 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 we, we we gotta take care of it. But they they just they ragged on me for that the whole course. Never let it go. Oh no, they shouldn't have. I wouldn't have done it for anybody else. It was pretty funny, you know, I'd laugh about it, but yeah, that was that. How much longer did your course go on after that? It was like halfway through the course. So it's like, I got another four weeks or something, you know, like four or five weeks. I was like, God dang it. Oh, so. that sounds like a really cool course. Like I that know was awesome. you, you learned a lot. So I don't know the details of the one that you do right now, but you mm -hmm. do something with bear right now on surveillance. No, we do, like, we do like an urban survival thing okay. with uh, Mitch from Agonic. Yeah. Um, so we do that, uh, Nashville, which is a pretty cool course, but it, we're not doing surveillance or anything okay. like that. It's gotcha. more centered around, because Mitch was a SEER instructor. Um, so the, the guys don't know, it's survival, evasion, resistance, and escape, right? Mm -hmm. So he basically teaches people, and I kind of help out a little bit. Um, we teach people on the first day, like, what's the most likely thing you're going to encounter? Urban unrest, power outage, natural disaster. Well, then we teach them, you know, medical stuff, that you know, improvised medicine, you mm -hmm. know, medical stuff. We teach them how to find shelter, and sustenance. And then we teach them urban navigation when you don't have cell phones and all this other stuff and how to like where satellites point like, Oh God, I didn't know that. And then oh, they point okay. to the equator, you know, or, or whatever. Um, so we kind of go over all that. It's pretty funny to see Mitch. <laughs> Mitch is hilarious, right? Wow, man. So we'll be going, he just goes to like a dumpster behind these restaurants. He'll dive in. Look at all this great food they threw away. <laughs> He's just like, what? He's just like, mm, that's an avocado, you know? And like, here, try this. And they're like, I already didn't fit out of a dozen, you know? <laughs> but like, we don't, we don't make them do that, but yeah. we kind of show them. And then the second day we basically have like, uh, apps, these secure messaging apps. And then we have trackers, right? Mm -hmm. Um, these geo tracker things and they have like a little pack on them. So they put their emergency shit and they have a little card. So it's like, Hey, if something happens, you know, just tell the cops, they know. And we're here and it's out of a hotel where we have a little command center, the conference room. And we, we watch them on the thing, but we update them like, Hey, this happened. What are you going to do? And they have to do certain things. Gotcha. Um, so basically the, the second day we just put them in a white van and we tell them like close their eyes or put some over their head and then we drop them off in the city and then got to figure out where it is. Can they cheat? Yeah. But like the fun is that they don't. So yeah. they get the secure messaging stuff and they do their best to like do that. Is it hard? Not at all. It's not hard, but it, it's fun. Yeah. So really pretty much the second day, I just pick people up in a big 15 passenger van and, you know, drop them off and keep shuttle them around. But they're going to go through the three lanes we have set up in Nashville. Gotcha. So it's pretty neat. That sounds awesome. Yeah. Wow. It, 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 you, you talking about, you know, tracking someone through the streets of London made me think of that. <clears throat> um, yeah, that sounds like an awesome school. It was, it, it was a lot of fun. Yeah. But and again, by no means am I saying I'm Mr. Expert on that. Sure. But it was pretty neat to go do that training with some of the best in the world at that. Mm -hmm. um, and then also get to put that, into application, you know, in different ways, a little bit in Iraq and then also in Afghanistan and some other stuff. So it was neat. It opens your eyes to a lot of things. How, so. how did it, how did you use that in the future? Uh, so, and we were doing that stuff in Afghanistan I told you about. Oh, okay, um, that one. Just yeah. setting up a city, knowing our routes, this mm -hmm. and that. Um, we weren't doing exactly that, mm -hmm. but knowing that stuff made us better at our jobs. 
So gotcha. yeah. and you mentioned that you also deployed on your own to <clears throat> oh gosh, do you say Syria? Uh, Turkey. 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 Okay. Yeah. So that was that was interesting. That was just like an office job out of like the embassy annex over here, working with some other people that were way cooler than me. Uh, but my job, so that was an eye-opening experience, um, especially getting to see the congressmen that come in and the senators, because we're briefing these congressmen and senators every couple of weeks because this whole Syria thing's about to kick off and realizing just how absolutely dumb these people are and how they have no clue whatsoever about what's going on, nor do they actually give a shit. So there was one Congress, we had this group of Congress people, right? Congresswoman, Congressman, whatever. This lady from California, she's from Long Beach. She's like, oh, hi, I'm so-and-so. I'm like, oh. yes, I'm, I'm, the, your con I'm here to tell you about what we're doing, our part of the pie here, and what we're doing for, you know, what's going on. And she was like, oh, oh, where are you from? I'm like, I live in Tennessee. She's like, oh, well, if you ever, California, like, vote for me and like walked. It was like something out of us. It's like something Saturday Night Live would make fun of these people. These people are some of the dumbest people you will ever encounter in your entire life. There was one guy that showed up with questions that wanted to know, that was ready to go, that asked amazing questions. But unfortunately, we didn't get the questions at time. So we're like, straight, like, okay, we're going to get all this for you. He was genuinely wanted to know everything. And I noticed something was different about him when I looked at his watch. He's wearing a suit like he's supposed to wear. He's got a, a Timex Iron Man watch, mm. $45 watch, because he's like, when I go run and I do this, I like it. I was like, oh, you're different. Oh, you're These other people being. showed up with lots of money, expensive shit, you know, $10,000 this, you know, their suspenders cost more than my entire outfit, you know, stuff like that. Mm -hmm. um, they were complete buffoons. Like they were, it was a joke. It was embarrassing, honestly, seeing a lot of these Congress people that showed up. <clears throat> are they all like that? No. That one Senator who showed up, he was switched on. Love him or hate him. He, at least he was switched on, wanted to know. It was uh, Bob Corker. So I'll say that. But I have a- I, Corker? I, yeah, he was from Tennessee. He doesn't, he doesn't, I don't think he's in anymore. You know who he is, right, Nick? Yeah. So I don't know anything about him politically. I just knew that one interaction with him and his team. Because he cared. He, he was genuinely focused on what was going on and he, he genuinely wanted to know. And he had amazing questions that stuff that we hadn't thought about that really kind of was interesting. So, mm. uh, the rest of them fucking idiots, embarrassing, yeah. the most embarrassing thing I've ever seen. So, uh, again, we only saw like, I didn't see all of Congress, but you know, the 10 that I did see, I was like, wow, this is, this is not what, uh, I think people, you know, expect out of somebody in that position. Sure. Yeah. So. You mentioned uh, uh, at the time Vice President Biden visited while you were there. Mm -hmm. What was the, how was that um, received internally, like amongst like you and the guys? I know you don't, I know you guys would show respect, but yeah, yeah. what was the feeling really? Well, it, we have a job to do, yeah. you know, and it doesn't matter who sits in that office. We have a job, we're going to do our job, right? So um it was when he was vice president. Uh, he came out and we had to pull like some security thing, right? Basically, we were like a QRF. So some of our guys went on this ground convoy with, with them and some others and this big thing they had going on. That was whatever. But um, our guys, you know, they did that when they're supposed to do. Our, we, our job was like, if something happened, we're going to get on a bird, we're going to do it, right? Which is a common thing, right? Um, we did not interact with him directly other than like a walk by or this or that. Um, the guys that did, and the, we had some secret service guys with us and then other guys there. Uh, I will say this, those secret service guys that came with us, they were awesome, man. They showed up and they're like, how you guys doing? We're like, what's up, dude? He's like, I brought you something and pulls out logs of Copenhagen from America <laughs> or in Iraq. And we're like, we like you. Come my here. people. What do you need, buddy? You know, like my, my man, you know? And he was like, what's up? Just started handing out dip and was like, Hey, uh, uh, I got this thing. Uh, we're like, you mean your radio? You know, he's like, yeah. So he was super cool. Like we loaded him up. We got him everything he needed. There's some stuff he didn't have. We just gave it to him. It was off the books. Um, they were great, man. Great. Really, wow. really, really good dudes. Um, but you know, I'm not, I don't get into that too mm -hmm. much. Like when, when you're doing that job, like you have responsibilities, swore an oath, like, Hey, this is the elected thing from the people love it or hate it. Like, I don't give a shit if I hate the person in office nobody's going to hurt this guy. That's, mm -hmm. that's the seat of, you know, whatever, like that's the face of America. Yeah. <laughs> Unfortunately. Uh, but that is what it is, right? So we're going to be professional. We're going to do our jobs. Um, I will say I quit dipping for seven years. 
before that. Actually, when I went to England, I, I took my dip out right on the flight before, and I like threw in the trash can right as I got on the thing. And I remember the lady, like, the lady on the flight, as I'm walking, the thing was like, oh, you know, <laughs> I didn't dip for another seven years uh, until that night. We had to do that because it just sucked. Right? Yeah, and it's part of the job, right? Like we'd get on the bird, we get off the bird. They spin the birds over, we get back off. We did this for like. 12, 18 ounce. I don't know. It was a long time. Yeah. And it's like, dude, we got to get back on again. They're like, oh, something bad's happening. Get on. And they're like, oh, never mind. It's nothing. Oh, something bad's happening. Get back on. We're like, it's just part of the job. Like, you just expect that stuff. I remember I didn't, I didn't dip seven years. And I was like, oh, I'm just angry. I got, you know, shit I'm angry about outside of this, you know, whatever. Yeah. And, you know, just life stuff going on. I was like, I need a dip. And all the guys on my cell, like my assault cell, were like, you quit dipping. I remember this one guy, Hambone. It was like Copenhagen cans because I was sitting on like our little side by side thingy with all our shit on it to drive it up under the bird. And they were like, Copenhagen cans were coming out of nowhere, like hitting me. Like, ding, ding. I was like, Jesus. I'm so like, oh, like getting hit. I like a little mark. I was like, oh, I got it. I got it. I got like, you want long cut? You want snow? You want this? You want that? I'm like, dude. I was like, I quit dip for seven years. You guys are like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Drew, have a dip. Have it be like us, Drew. Yes. You know, I'm like, dang it, man. So I started dipping. So I jokingly say, uh, jokingly, I started dipping after seven years because of Joe Biden. So. Oh, but, yeah. Wow. Yeah. So that's again, solid. You have a job to do. None of that matters. Right? Yep. That's elected. That's what it is. Like whoever the people vote and put up in, in those positions, right? Or however that works. That's our job in the military. You, it's not biased. You can't be that way. Mm -hmm. Like you... You are, you know, accountable to those people, the people who elected. So love them or hate them. Gotcha. So. Well, we could keep diving into all of your deployments and such, but yeah. before, you know, we, we continue to move on and at some point I have to close out a podcast. I yeah. want to hear some about Bear Solutions, spinning that up, um, you know, stepping away from the military and then kind <clears throat> of just your mindset on, obviously there's a huge difference between being in the yeah. military and teaching people professionally through being Green Beret versus now what you're doing where people pay money to show up and working in the firearms industry. So first of all, did you know before you stepped away from fifth group that you wanted to do something, which is now Bear Solutions? Yes and no. So, um, so for me getting out, like I had a lot of injuries between the neck, between the back, between, you know, like this arm, like especially my left hand, that's at 50 to 60% strength in my right. It's just atrophied from the nerve damage that I had. Um, there's a lot of little things that are just always going to be there, you know, and then the knees and the ankle and the shoulder and then the head injuries. I'm like, dude, <sighs> kicking and screaming, right? The doctor was like, Hey man, you can stay in the military, but you got to think about your quality of life. Got to think about your family. Like what else? So I made the, the conscious decision uh, to get out. And part of that was my wife too, who I'm very grateful for. Um, so, when I got out, I'm different now than I was in the military, like most people are, right? But I had a lot of uh, growing up and realizations the day as I got out. And so for me, that was wrapped up. It's who I was. That's all I could really think about. Like there was a lot of guys in my job that were great on a team, great Green Berets, just barrel-chested freedom fighters, you know, the, the example of what a professional is. And they were also great husbands, great fathers who loved their wives. They did the right thing. They raised their kids right. And they, they knew how to be at the job to be this way. And they knew when they went home, they needed to be a different way. I was not that person. I, I could not, it took me a long time to learn that. Um, cause I couldn't understand it. Right. Um, so when I got out, it's probably one of the better things that happened to me personally. And then for my, especially with my daughter and my wife. So my daughter, like we have a relationship now that I don't know if I would have if I was still in the military. Not because other people can't do it. A lot of guys do. It just it took me, it took that for me to realize it. Like now my daughter, what a badass dude. She beat up that little loser kid at dance on the stage. That was Stupid fucking great. Like I bought her ice cream for that. Like, don't hit my kid. She's gonna hit you back, right? Like, I'm so proud of that kid. She's so good. Um, but how would she be if I was still in and I wasn't around as much? Like I'm, I'm gone a lot now, but I make the most of it when I'm home. And how would my relationship with my wife be? Like, that's a super important thing as a man is to not only have, not to be the provider, the leader and everything else, but you need someone that you can emotionally connect to, right? It's different. And that person, you know, whether you look at that biblically or whether you look at that just in general, that should be your wife, right? There, nobody should come above that. And once I got out, my, my relationship, my <laughs> 
tough times. There's been some hard crap in there. Don't get me wrong. I know you guys know you're both married. Sure. Like sometimes you just want to kill them, right? But <laughs> I said jokingly. But at the same time, she wants to do the same thing to me, right? She's like, how do I get him to die in his sleep? Right? You know, like <laughs> she's probably thinking that at some point, right? But I grew a lot when I got out. I'm very grateful for the relationship I have now. So for me, when I got out, I went to a training course when I was in. It sucked. And I was driving back with three guys in my, my car from my team at the point. <clears throat> and we all like shoot and do all that stuff. And we think we're pretty studly. And they were like, I was like, what'd you think of the course? They're like, it sucked, dude. And I was like, yeah, that was a big disappointment. So we all like jokingly said, well, let's start a, like a training company or something. Well, I got out and they all stayed in and doing other cool things. But like, I was like, I could do that, right? Doesn't mean I'm the best at it. No, but I think every year that I've had bare solutions, I've grown and I've made it a little bit better and I've learned a lot. Um, but it's constantly, you know, trying to be better, you know, because when you do this job, you're, you're doing it. This is a service industry. And some people don't fucking get that. And that pisses me off. People are paying you to help them. And the difference in working in the military and working here, when you do training in the military, everyone has to be there. Like, they're like, all right, come on, let's get it over with. When people are paying you, they show up ready to go with notes. Like, they're ready. Like, mm -hmm. I got eight hours, dude, let's go. That's a different environment, right? And don't get me wrong, there's, there's a lot of that too. Like, professionals, we take our training seriously in the military, but you know what I'm saying, right? Yep. Like, this is an expectation versus this is what I've spent my hard earned money. I got one weekend. I'm only do this one time this year. This is the only time I ever do it, but I'm, I want this. I need this and you're going to give it to me. You're providing a service and you're there for them. So <clears throat> that's, a, that's one of the differences. Cause you kind of mentioned it in the being in the military versus now. Um, so yeah, I, I can't say enough good things about, Man, I wish I was still in. I'm not going to lie. I'm kicking and screaming. I did not want to get out. I still want to do this. It's, you know, mess with me. I still want to go do that stuff. But honestly, for me personally, as a person and for my wife and for my daughter, um, that's more important. So when I got out, it's like, how do I focus on this and make my family? And the mission before was always do good things for your country and do it to those people over there before they get here. Mm -hmm. Right now it's, I'm going to do this at home but I need to focus and, and get a zoom in a little bit, right? I need to give a smaller view of what's important. And that's this family that comes first. So how do I do that? Well, I have a, a company that we have to earn money. You know, we got to do these things. You have to provide for the family, but you have to provide a quality service. So one is family first. That's what we say in our family, family first, period, each and every time. If you're going to do something, you do it full ass, not half ass. You ask my nine-year-old daughter, you'd be like, you better do that full ass. And she's like, oh, not half ass. You know, like she does, <laughs> right? So- there's that. And then what is that purpose? You know, now is I don't get to go do those things anymore, but I have some, some good experiences. I have some things that I do that I think are valuable. Right. And I can help others who are still doing it. So now I can support those people. And for me, a lot of it's been as the average day person, you know, I hate the term civilian. I, I hate that term. Yeah, me right? too. Yeah. And I know you guys use it like <sighs> no, jokingly, like tongue in cheek, dirty civilian. But like, I think of these people as just responsible, good Americans or mm -hmm. patriots. They're citizens. Citizens, yes. right? Like, however we want to put that, like without using the word comrade, because we're not fucking Russians. All yeah. right. So everyone stop using that dumb shit. Um, so <laughs> yeah, that Nick. said, <laughs> like we're these citizens of this country, like these people, like, whether it's them, whether it's the law enforcement who are sworn to protect them and their rights and their rights and the military who's going out and do this, stuff, all these people here, now we can support them and do stuff. One, it's fun to do it, right? It's also serious, but it's fun. Like we're teaching people how to shoot guns and we're teaching them, you know, stuff that we can do. Um, so that's good. I, I really, really enjoy it. So with that, and then it's, you know, how else do we do that? Well, we got Bear Solutions and we're launching our products, which coming out and we go live the next like oh, week or two I'm right pumped about your I'm too. and then i'm sending guys those so we got those belts coming out maybe by the time it comes out they'll already be on the site probably uh our new you know belts that are you know kit belts um and then we have our other company agonic so i will say one thing that i'm not saying i'm you know i've got it all figured out and i'm successful in this no but damn have i met some amazing people I have been extremely fortunate in the people that I meet. Like everything I've done is not by myself. Yeah, like whether it was the book, like I had a guy who he's got a doctorate in this stuff who's worked for SOCOM that helped me with that book and said, no dumbass, go this direction. With it. Okay, cool. What about this? What about that? He's always, I used to sit on his couch all the time. We just talk. Right? Seth. Yeah, dude. Yeah. Like guys like that, you know, and I've got him. And then you look at, 
with our training. You know, we got one guy running CQB. We got Paul doing medical, right? Great guy. Awesome. We've stuff. got uh, Mitch was doing survival. I got Joe coming on to do shooting. We got Steve doing some CQB stuff. We've got all this, right? And then Tom, you know, running our, you know, bare media that does everything, all the content we put out. I wouldn't do any of that shit if we didn't have Tom. What do you think <laughs> I'm going to do that? That guy's a gem, dude. Like, yeah. th he's the reason that stuff looks good. No, no, why we're able to do so much stuff. But then we started Agonic also. And Agonic came about because wearing a pistol concealed, it's uncomfortable, dude. Yeah. Like, and these leather belts and everything else, they hurt. Mm -hmm. And you have back problems. They cause hip impingements. They cause imbalances. They cause all this stuff. So Mitch and I developed it. Took us like a year and a half or so to figure it out because we went to different buckles and design. But we made a concealed carry belt that I go, damn, this is way more comfortable. And I can wear this gun longer and not be in pain because I have a broken back, right? Yeah. Like my back's screwed up and I have discs that are out of place in my spine. And then I have my hip imbalances and I got a whole thing with the right side of my hip. So all this stuff. Now I can wear a gun and feel better. So what do we do with that? Well, like we're making products for that like we want to fill a gap and a need you know we got the pants that we made too and mm -hmm. all this and we'll, we made a good product so what do we do patent it you know what i mean because yeah. that's the right thing to do like yeah. we came with a good idea so we patented and i'm sure there's going to be schmucks out there that do you know whatever but like it's patented you know, well, other people should we come up with like the placard to hide everything right yeah. we want all those clips to be hidden behind but you still have stretch in the belt but still look kind of like a normal belt not some like tactical riggers belt you know mm -hmm. with scuba webbing all over it and crazy buckles yeah like if you lift it up you should go oh nice belt yeah you shouldn't go he's got a gun you know right. like, yeah you know what i'm saying uh -huh. so yeah we came up with that and you know nobody else in the market had done it so we did it and uh we patented it and uh we got th three patents i think on that thing something like that good yeah. but yeah dude and our patent lawyer was really good with it um yeah so it's been cool man it's been cool seeing the products go yeah that's a whole nother world Dude, <laughs> yes. making products is, is wild. And so, getting so. into textile too, like getting into clothing, that is an people don't realize yeah. how much of a nightmare that is. It I mean, is. people think, oh, we just you, you just pop up a print on demand shop. It's like, <laughs> oh no, like no. sure you, you can, can do that, but yeah. for anything that's actually like quality or mm -hmm. custom or like has some love and passion put into it, yeah. Oh no, 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 it's a whole nother ball. So, um, with you leaving the military, I'm sure you've figured this out really quick. Um, I forgot what this concept is called. I'm sure that someone who watches a ton of reels or, yeah. or, you know, YouTube videos knows it, but it's essentially like, you know, vertical and horizontal learning and the amount of horizontal learning that you've had to do just to move forward yeah. is outrageous. Like you've started two businesses. <clears throat> yeah. You've learned how to design and make pants and yeah. consult on all that stuff. Like it, uh, you've amassed a cadre, you're <clears throat> doing scheduling. Um, what, what would you have ever imagined that you would end up, that it would grow to this <laughs> shit? No, dude. <laughs> so like if you asked anybody that knew before uh -huh. college where they're like, where's drill? Well, I don't know. He's I saw him get arrested last night. Like, no, <laughs> like no one's going to guess that or he's yeah. working at a bar, you know, like whatever, like, or the guys in the military, like really drew, like, I mean, he's not a dummy, but like, He's kind of a me, you know what I mean? Yeah. And then all this, like learning. So take a look when we made pants, right? So we got our pants. We got two different fits. Designing pants, you're like, I want this, this, and that. Great. Now do your tech pack. A what? A oh, tech yeah, pack. A what, a what like, is that? Uh, so now you have to go with every single thing and every stitch and this and that. And you got to have inspiration boards and what you're pulling from. But now you make sure this doesn't line up with that. And do you know how hard it is to pick a color? Mm -hmm. I was like, oh. I want brown. And they were like, there are 3,800 versions of brown <laughs> like and all of cars. them are different. You're like, what? It's like, so then you're, you're thinking, uh, so you got to put together a color palette. So our company has a color palette and this goes with this. And these are these kind of colors. And this is your brand book and how everything's presented. And this is that. And oh yeah, by the way, you got to decide how with each size, how it grows out. So you need a type bag for each one and you need to scale it and this and that. Oh, and then this company does this, but you've actually got a that's just a cut and sew shop. So you got to source your fabric, which you need to order more fabric than you're going to make in pants. Then you decide how you're going to do that. So you need know, certain types of materials, but even though it's, you know, su such amount of cotton and then polyester, or po polyester and spandex, or elastic, whatever you want to call it, there's different types of that and thicknesses. Well, then you got to take that. Okay, cool. Then you got to source your buttons and your fixtures and your zippers and then your patches. And then you have to do certain tagging. Then you have your tagging that goes on the pants afterwards. <laughs> And you're like, I don't, I don't want to do this anymore. Yeah. You know, but it's like, My we were to commit a man. So it's man. like, okay. You know, yeah. it's like, oh, well, your crotch on those pants was 
an eighth of an inch or a quarter of an inch too much in the, too little in the gusset. So it's causing this type of fabric to do this. So you actually need to add a quarter inch in the gusset here so you don't get this effect on the fabric, which will make it last longer. And you're like, again, I don't want to do this anymore. You know, science it is, it. man. And it's, you can just make some shit easily. Mm -hmm. But if you want to do it well, you, you really got to learn that. And it's something else. I got just an <laughs> iPad. So you guys have the Good Notes app on your iPad? Yeah, you told me about it. It's yeah. been amazing. I've got just notebooks. Uh -huh. There's like in that good, you can pick different notebooks mm -hmm. and it's like agonic. It's got bear. It's got drills. It's got the book. It's mm -hmm. got thoughts. It's got stuff for my daughter. It's got, you know, um, what's it called? Treatments, you know, and scripts mm -hmm. for stuff we're going to do in videos on YouTube. It's got all kinds of stuff like that. So it's just, it's a lot, man. I'm not saying I'm doing it right. I'm, I'm doing it. I don't know if I'm doing it right, but we're, we're figuring out as we go. Lots yeah. of mistakes get made, but that's how you learn, man. You just got to make mistakes and keep going. Yeah. So. so something that a lot of people have noticed is there are some very good <clears throat> silent professionals that come out of the military. Oh, yeah. And there's a lot of silent professionals that step out of the military and they step into, oh, I'm going to write a book because I have yeah. really cool stories. Or I'm going to yeah. start a training company and I'd love to share my knowledge with other people. But then their full-time job is marketing themselves. And in doing so... Yeah. I don't know if they were always like this or if it's just human nature, but they very easily become clearly self-centered to a fault to where it's like, you're not marketing yourself anymore. You just think you're the only person on the world. Mm -hmm. You have done a really good job in balancing the two somehow. So how do you professionally market yourself? Be able to state, hey, these are some of my accomplishments, experiences, as well as some, you know, my cadre. I have this amazing group of guys that can share valuable information with you guys. You should come train with us. In fact, these are courses that you can pay money to sign up for. Come to this event. You should take PTO. Come take this event. Take this class. How do you balance those two while you're pushing yourself professionally, but staying humble and still a silent professional in your own way? So it, I think it's tough for anybody to get that to do this, right? And I, I don't know if I'm doing it well. Just take your word for it. But it's hard. Well, how do you think? You have to do this. You have to promote yourself in some way, right? It's like bear solutions. Like, cool. What do people, if they sign up for bear costs, what do they want to see? Me. They don't want me to be there, right? So I, I've got to start advertising those guys, and that's normal. Um, it's a really tough thing. And it's, you can't help people if you don't make money and you can't make money if you don't get your name out there and, and provide good stuff. Right. So I think there's quite a few guys and you say silent professional. There's probably a lot of guys here that are like, that guy ain't a silent professional. And I'd say, you know what? You're probably right. I'm not. And people get out and they write books, right? Cause they got good stories. I think those books are really important because what did I grow up reading? Those books, those books, mm -hmm. right? Like books on Vietnam seals and green berets and all this stuff. And I read black Hawk down before the movie ever came out. I remember it was coming out. I was like, Oh my God, I'm so excited. Right. And I waited years and it finally came out and I got made. I remember all that. Like I love those books. Right. I read uh, the Richard Marcinko books, you know, the rogue warriors. Right. And they were like this shit. I was like, I don't care. It's awesome. Right. Loved it as a kid. Marine sniper, Carl's oh, Hathcock. all of it, dude. dude like yeah. I read, uh, books on Jedbergs, like all of it. So I think there's, I think guys should write books about stuff. Um, as long as they're doing it for the right reasons. I think you are right. You'll see guys get out and then that's important. You got to do it. You have to promote, you have to market, you know, I think there's a the right way to do it. I think there has been some instances where, where people have done stuff, whether it's a book or whether it's a podcast or whether it's a YouTube channel or whether it's any of these things, they let it go to their head because they're, stuck in an echo chamber of just, Oh my God, you're so amazing. Right? So you need, you need someone to tell you you're not amazing. I, I have a few of those people. Uh, it's good. One is my wife. My wife called me a douchebag, by the way, after that video we did with the CQB. Here? Yeah. Are you she serious? saw the opening of it. She's like, <laughs> kind of a douchebag. We I was told like, you to. I know. I was well, like, that was the point. She's like, yeah, just douchey. She's you, like, I don't know. I don't can... know. And I, she was like, she looked at me weird. And I was like, what? Screw you. you know, like, <laughs> yeah. I'm like, man, like, but I mean, like one, my wife ain't going to tolerate that shit. Yeah. If I get a big head, she's not there to inflate my ego. Right. Like, I mean, I think she's proud of what we do as a family and everything we're building, but like, she'll tell me. Right. Um, 
she also doesn't know this space very well. She does not involved in this stuff, right? Um, but I got like Joe, like I mm -hmm. sent Joe a video that I just did. And I was like, this video sucks. I can't post that. It was when we filmed down there with Lou Pold, with Steve oh, Winnegar. I was like, I sound like a fucking idiot, dude. I sound like <laughs> such an idiot. And I was like, I can't do this. And I sent it to Joe and he's like, shut up. It's fine. Post it. I was like, he goes, whatever. I was like, okay. But at least I can have those guys, right? The other thing is I still go I'm back on the base and I work out at Fifth Group's gym once in a while. Not every day, but like maybe once a week, every two weeks. I know all the strength coaches there. I, I like to talk to them and they help me out. So those guys, like, I don't ever want to walk in to my old unit and those guys go, that's that one dude. Screw that. I'm like, that's that bear guy. Like, what, whatever, dude. This shit sucks. The guy's not this. He doesn't represent us well. So you got to have the douchebag check, right? Droosh, so, droosh bag. Droosh that's bag. what I was called in college. <laughs> really? So we, you can right. use that one I'm too. I'm not going to use that. Your name is Drew also. <laughs> I'm not using that at all. <laughs> Drucifer, Edit droosh that bag. that shit out. I don't want anybody to hear that. <laughs> no, so... <laughs> Like, I, I don't know. I, I rely on those people because, like, no matter what, you, ever, it can happen to anybody. You know what I mean? Like, you just got to keep the perspective. So I rely on people to tell me, and I have people I trust to tell me. Um, I also ask them questions, you know? So if I ever get that way, I expect them to. Like, I expect the guys that work with me, like Paul, Mitch, Steve, Joe, that are helping Bear Solutions, and even, are like, guys that are regional dudes, like Durling and Riley. Like, if I act like a schmuck, dude, you, you need to – tell me like, I don't ever want to be that way. Um, so that's a, that's a fear of mine. Um, so I think some dudes do go down that route and other guys, um, they don't, but I, I think it's, you can't just be like, no, I'm not doing that. You know, I'm not going to promote it. You have to, man, it's a business. You have to do, I would never have a YouTube or an Instagram. Like I just got on, what's that X thing? It's like tw Twitter. Yeah, it's Twitter. It's, it's yeah. the new Twitter, right? So that thing, <laughs> that yeah. Twitter, sorry. So that thing, I just got on there because like, they were like, Hey man, you should probably have another Avenue. That's people are kind of migrating. They're like, shit, I got to do that now. All right. So I got one of those. Um, and we made one post, you know, it's more but, than us. It's one and word, I was like, yeah. we in here now. That's all I, I said. <laughs> we fancy. That's what I said. <laughs> yeah. We're fancy now. Uh, but you know, you have to put stuff out and guess what? It's got to have you in it. Mm -hmm. Right. But are you bringing education? Right. So some people say you can do education, impact and entertainment, right? Those are kind of three pillars of content you put out. Cool. But first, it's got to be education. That's got to be number one. You can make it entertaining and you can make it impactful and you can probably do all three. But if you're not having entertainment, that's, or if you don't have the education, you're kind of screwed. Mm -hmm. So to me, I see like some guys are, um, how do you say it, professionals and some are personalities. And some guys started out as professionals and they went to the personality side. Mm -hmm. That's fine. Like there's a lot of money on the personality side, right? Like there's training companies. They're not professionals. They're just personalities, you know, and they have some guys like that's, that, that exists. So that's okay. Right. But just know which one you are. Right. So I would like to stay on the professional side, but we are doing content. We're going to do that because we have Tom that can do all this amazing stuff and he wants to do it and we have the resources available. So why wouldn't we do it? You know, mm -hmm. um, but it's tough, man. It's really hard. Yeah. Like I wouldn't have any of this, but I didn't have a company. None wouldn't have any of it. Yeah. I wouldn't have a Facebook, wouldn't have an Instagram, wouldn't have a, a, definitely wouldn't have a damn YouTube, right? I wouldn't look at any of that <laughs> shit. I would just literally like go to work, go to the gym, hang out with my family and shoot some guns. It sounds yeah, nice, so. huh? And yeah, it is. <laughs> yeah. I think we need vacations. Like yeah, I gotta get away from this shit, but yeah, I don't know. That's, that's how I look at it. You guys see it the same way or? Yeah, very much so. Um, I haven't always looked at it that way. Um, <clears throat> I... I wouldn't have, you know, you said you wouldn't have social media or any of this stuff if it weren't for, you know, growing your business. Yeah. I certainly probably would not be on camera if, yeah. if we didn't need it for DC. Hmm. Um, I don't enjoy being on the camera. I like, I, I enjoy making cool things. I like enjoy, I enjoy making um, creative projects come to life and making something that I love. And then whenever I get to see that it either helps someone or inspires someone or, man, someone just like, man, it made them smile, made them laugh, made them want to go do something, made them want to go yeah. try something new. Like, that's what I like. And so social media to me is just an <clears throat> avenue to pursue that passion. Yes. Um, to me, it's but, like, this is the business, right? Mm -hmm. What do I have to do for my business to be successful and to grow in the right ways, right? Mm -hmm. Well, you got to have social media. And then, okay, cool. I want to grow here. We have products coming out. So how do we, you got to have a YouTube, 
Okay, cool. So, but all that should feed the business. Right. Those shouldn't be the business. Not mm -hmm. for me, at least, right? The business is a concept. It's what you're doing, but these are the avenues we put out the information and it's the funnel, right? They're ladders or funnels to drive people to one place, which mm -hmm. is for us, it's bare solutions. And that's filling up Paul's medical classes, right? That's filling up the shooting classes, you know, getting CQB classes or, or whatever, you know, and it's selling products with a gonic and, you know, bear, yeah. but everything's a funnel. It should drive it there. Um, I'm curious, are you, would you consider yourself a consumer of media, especially on the social media side? On the social media side? Uh -huh. do okay. you, what do you mean by consumer? Okay. So me, eight or nine years ago, I was yeah. constantly watching people's videos, mm -hmm. watching people's videos, getting inspiration, all that stuff. But mostly just like, <clears throat> I wasn't, I wasn't, I enjoyed it. I was a bit addicted to it. Now, I... I avoid opening up Instagram at all costs. Yeah. I only get on to make some posts for, for DC, um, to check DMs on that and my other account and see what my friends are doing. See, like, you know, did Bear post anything? Did Derek post anything? Steve? Yeah, that's about it. I mean, I'll look at comments and stuff, but, like, I very rarely doom scroll, and I feel like a lot of people, um, I'm, I'm glad there's a ton of people out there that consume content. Oh, yeah. After all none of us would have so livelihoods go yeah. exactly um but i'm just like way more purposeful in how i consume now whereas just being a general <clears throat> consumer of just like i want to watch everything so yeah i get caught i go down the rabbit hole on things do you doom scroll i don't know i don't know what you mean by that but just like you just get locked in and just keep going and that's going. doom scrolling yeah okay yeah. yeah i'll go down that rabbit hole a little bit yeah but i do it on weird things like like you look at my accounts like what do i follow and you're like Okay, if I was this, and there's some shooting stuff in there, you know, like, I like there's some like really cool guys I like to watch shoot, mm -hmm. like uh, Isaac Lockwood from Shooting, Training, Competing. Like, I love watching that guy shoot. Mm -hmm. uh, I like watching JJ shoot. There's a couple other guys too. Like, man, th those guys, I like watching them do their thing. Yeah. You know, I just learn from watching them do stuff. Mm -hmm. uh, and then there's like the stripe life. You know what that is? Stripe no. life? No. It's mowing your yard, bro. Oh, oh dude. Putting stripes in the yard. I'm like, yes. like man, look at that yard. <laughs> look at the stri Oh, those are perfect. Such a dad. He did the check and the, oh, those uh -huh. are a damn chessboard. Yes. Hats They're off so to you, sir. I like the yeah, videos. Skag lawnmowers. <laughs> <laughs> Woo! Like, you know my I got fitness stuff. I do that fitness. I do a yeah. lot of like rehab stuff, but uh -huh. like I'll go down the rabbit hole on that. Yeah. Um, I like watching a studio binder. Yes. So they do a great job in like uh, red to um, like cameras and like how these people do this in film. Mm -hmm. It's like, oh, that's what that's called. Like a Copenhagen shot where like twists and mm -hmm. does stuff, right? We did something a little bit like that in our medical video, but it's like, that's cool. I wonder if we could do that. Mm -hmm. And I'll ask Tom about it. And he's like, yeah, you know, or no, we need different kind of equipment for it. But I wonder if we can like jerry rig something, you know, and like yeah. pull it off kind of. Um, but yeah, I like stuff like that. I like movies, dude. I'm a big movie guy. I yeah. have, after spending yeah. more time with Drew and then, you know, Chad, Charles, Nick, all yeah. those guys, learning the art behind a movie. We just, uh, oh, yeah. as a crew, we went and watched Oppenheimer and it was a good movie, yeah. but I loved watching the art that they put together. Yes. Fun storyline, <clears throat> very well shot. And yeah. that was the joy for me. And I hadn't really discovered I used to give you all homework assignments. You like, did. Hey, you have to go like, watch this movie. This week, you have to watch this movie. This week, you have yeah. to watch this movie. Yeah. Which plays into, I don't, I don't really, I'm the guy who's stuck in front of the camera because I don't know how to do anything behind <laughs> the camera, right, but I that. love yeah. working on a project as a crew. Yeah. So I probably wouldn't have a YouTube either. I didn't have anything YouTube related before, you know, we started doing DC but I love connecting with people and the art working on a project together and then having a final result that it's like, we did something, we accomplished yeah. a task together. That's uh, I, I love that component to it. Yeah. Once you, once you start learning about that and like, especially doing this, do you ever look at all oh, that cut to here and then this scene and like how they're putting this together and how they're getting a certain effect with the camera? Or like, they're breaking neat. rules yeah. that wasn't supposed to happen. They, they weren't even, yeah. they weren't supposed to do that. I love when they break rules. Yes. They go yeah, against me too. stuff. Yes. Right? Like, to break the rules, you got to know them really well. Exactly. First, you know? I tell my daughter that. I'm like, hey, before you break the rules, you better know them really well. You mm -hmm. know, I was like, there's going to go time and place, baby. You're going to break a ton of rules in life, but you got to know them really well first. So you know when to do it. Right. And she's like, okay. And the other day she was like, she did, what the hell did she do? She did something. She was like, well, I felt like it was right to break the rules. I was like, oh. oh. I go, okay. All right. I go, let's talk about that. 
And she was talking about, I was like, yeah, that wasn't it. You know, we it a bit. She was like, yeah. I go, okay. She's learning. She's good. But uh, no, I like that too. I like watching and seeing how it puts it together. Tom's opened up my eyes to a lot of that. It was like movies, but now it's like, oh, that's interesting how they achieved that effect. Does right. he play the find the light game with you? Where you look, you just look at a scene, oh, take like a screen you grab, and you ask yourself, where's the light coming from? Ah, uh, no. And then you can start to piece yeah. together. You can, you know, basically... See, recreate yep. the set in your mind at what you know so that's interesting yeah, yeah that, that's good to him just telling me that i was like oh yeah yeah about that yeah, Fair enough. it's good for me to know where those lights are that i don't even know how to set up <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah yeah but i can tell nick like yeah. hey, let's he knows what here. he's doing yeah. yeah nick you doing good over there yeah i done mute my mic do you uh since you're here too do you have any questions you've thought of for drew i do they're very random, but where did the name Bear mm. Solutions come from and Agonic and what's like the meaning on the logo for Bear? Um, so I had a guy make the logo, told him what I wanted, and that's what he came out with. I was like, yeah, that, that was pretty much it and better. So we got that. Um, so Bear, it's spelled B-A-E-R. Do you know how many e fucking emails I get? For people being like, huh, huh, did you know you spelled Bear wrong? I'm oh. like, oh, no, please. What? When did this happen? Like... <laughs> Like Jesus, dude. Did, did you purchase B E A R Solutions nope. LLC dot com also? No, Just for should. people who do misspell it and redirect. Yeah. Maybe I did. I think I have like ten different you should. ones. I should get on there. You should run it for a year. I'm gonna see do how that many before you, you you guys post this, so someone else doesn't rush out and get it. Yeah. Um. Yeah. So bear. Uh. If I had a son, so what I usually tell people is, I'm like, why is it spelled back wrong? <laughs> I'm like, it's dude, I was wrong. doing my F E I N, you know, like registering as a business. And it was a typo, and I just didn't <laughs> fix it, so I kept it. So that's they, what I that's what I usually uh, yeah. That's it's like if I don't want to tell you the whole story, like, and you're just kind of being a a real Mick Mick douchebag. Yeah, uh, I'm kind of like whatever. I don't feel like I'll tell people that. Yeah. Um, but really, what it was, was one if we had a son, we were going to name him Bear. That's how I was going to name it, right? So mm -hmm. I really like that name. Uh, we had a daughter. That's what God gave us, and she's been awesome, and I'm I'm very grateful for that. Uh, so I named the company Bear. A uh, two. We're, well, I was on Bravo Cell. That was my, like when I was, that last uh, team I was on, our company, the SIF company, we had set up like an assault troop. I was on B Cell, Bravo Cell. And uh, for some reason, we were like, ah, Bear Cell. I don't know. It was funny. But mainly because the guys on Alpha Cell, like, <laughs> okay, it, this might be not safe for work, but like, those, those guys were like uncircumcised. So uh -huh. we called them uh, Anteater Cell, and they were like, <laughs> we were like joking around, and then we gave like every cell names, and they were like, that's a stupid, we thought it was pretty funny. It was yeah. funny for us, not for the other guys. Yes, that is but, uh, We made little patches. I actually have one in my truck, I think I can show you, but it's a bear, and it has my cell tag on it. Uh, we baited him while we were overseas, like, but yeah, it kind of came from that, and then uh, I love that that team, uh, with Hambone, and... Uh, J-Bar, like really good dudes, man. I learned a lot from J-Bar and Hambo's a really good dude. Um, and then bears are the only, you ever look up bears? They're so cool. They're, they they're are. the only like self-aware land mammal in North America, like that will actually kill another animal with an object. So like polar bears will knock off ice to kill something else. Like bears, like stories like grizzly bears, like using a rock and like bludgeoning stuff. I was like, wait, Whoa. they use weapons. I didn't know that. How cool are bears? Heck right? yeah, that's pretty so, rad. Yeah, so that, and then uh, the last reason is because it is the only animal I knew in Arabic. So like, we have to take our Arabic test. It's dub, by the way. Dub. They're like, oh, what's your favorite, like, uh, something, Mufadala, Hadika al Hawana. Like, what's your favorite animal at the zoo? Like, something like that. I'm like, al dubs. And they're like, <laughs> that's, you don't just put an S on things to make it plural. They're like, ah, oh. like, and they ask me in Arabic, like, Anything specifically? And I'm like, Al Dubs Polar, because it's like a cognate. <laughs> oh, and like, they would just be like, oh, minimum score. Like, got it. You know, so. D is for diploma. Yeah, there's a lot of, <laughs> there you go. Like, uh, so I just, oh, I was like the only animal I can remember because it was dub. I was like, cool. Nice. So I would just say that. So, yeah, a bunch of areas are reasons for that. And then, yeah, that's, yeah, that's it, really. Gotcha. So I wanted good. it to look like our logo, like, 
It's not like, hey, what's your training company called? Yes, it's called Tactical Elite Death Killer Squad 5000. Yes, right. And uh, we have a, a skull with nods on it and crossed pistols and everything. Uh, and all, it looks like a terrible affliction shirt. All you know? in the shadow of a Spartan helmet. Yeah, like, <laughs> hey, man, I think we're, we're tired of that. So I was like... I was like, I like bears, so like, let's do that. <laughs> and like, I just, I wanted you to wear the shirt and it says Bear Solutions on it. Yeah. People are like, cool. And you could wear it to like Whole Foods and people wouldn't be like, you know, see the logo and be like, ah, you know, like, yeah. or anyone else see the logo and be like, oh God, really? Mm -hmm. Like, I don't, we don't need tactical affliction. I, I'm, I don't want that. So we just yeah. try to make it a little more tasteful. So that's kind of where we went with it. Nice. So. Dude, Nick, what else you got? Oh, that was it besides Agonic. Where that name actually came oh, from. Oh, Agonic, yeah. Uh, so Agonic, Mitch came up with that. Uh, that's his name. Uh, so Agonic is the only line in like a ma magnetic, you know, there's like your compass. Mm -hmm. You know how like there's magnetic north, like true, and then everything off of that is like a few degrees different. So it is true north. The Agonic line is the line that's always changing, you know, around the earth is slowly, right? Changing around the earth, that is the one line that's true north. Oh, so, I did not know And that's that. why wow. we say hold true. That's like the, uh, the gotcha. slogan for Agonic. So when he said that, I was like, yeah, dude, that's yeah. It. get that shit. Mm -hmm. Like, let's go. Yeah. So let's that's do cool. it. Yeah, man. That's pretty much it. Well, I have one cool. final question for you. Someone, someone on Patreon asked uh, the most important question. Yes. Ooh. You'll answer. We could have started with this, but we wanted to save the best for last. Okay. Oh, this is a funny one. Oh. Yeah, well. Oh, it's a zinger. Like, uh, do you follow F1 at all? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So this guy must know that. So he was curious. Who's your favorite F1 team and your favorite F1 driver and why? Okay. I, I kind of like all of them, right? Because the thing I like about F1 is it's about the car. It's about the team and what they build. Like you could put like fucking Alex Albon, right? You can take him who's like, you know, 10th or something like that and put him in a Red Bull. Well, guess what? He's as good as we're sapping right. pretty damn close. You know what I mean? Um, but I like, I kind of like all of it. My two teams that I like a lot, one is Williams Racing. I like yes. Williams a lot. Yes. And I like that Logan Sargent, there's an American on the team, but I liked him before that. I want, I want Williams to come back and get good. Right. And hopefully they do. I think they're investing more in it. They've got some new people involved running it. Um, hopefully they will over the next, you know, decade. Um, I like Williams a lot. And um, I like Red Bull because they don't give a shit. Nope. If you perform, you're in. If you suck, you're out. Everybody else can suck it. And they don't care. And they're winners. And if you don't like that, well, fuck off, dude. Yep. Um, I don't, I'm not really a fan. I like the drivers for Ferrari. I like, for, I want to like Ferrari, but to me, they're kind of like, they're like UT, like the University of Texas, like the Longhorns. Everyone's like, they're the best. They suck <laughs> and they're overrated every year. Okay. They're not good. They're like, but they're, no, they're not. But they got, no, they're not. They're going to disappoint you every year. Right. That's Ferrari, right? Like at least recently. Um, and then, yeah, I like Red Bull and I like, uh, uh, Williams a lot. There's just dry. I've been like, I kind of like all of them really. I kind of get sick of like, there's a few of them. Uh, what's that? You know, that are, you know, um, his name rhymes with, I think it's Lewis Hamilton. That's kind of a whiny bitch. But like, other than that, like I'm tired of hearing that dude. Like he got, they're, they're prima donna, you know, they had all the money tiny that little they were dudes that, the yeah, cars. And then all in this car and they have one sole focus. So like, yes, they're going to be a little, you know, uptight about shit and stuff. Yeah. Like we got it. But, um, yeah, I'm not – I respect him as a driver, great driver. Don't get me wrong. Uh, but, like, I could do without, you know what I mean? How do, yeah. how do you feel about the cap that they put, what, two years ago on each team can only spend so much money on, I, like, at the end of the year? Because yeah. that's when previously Verstappen had beaten Lewis yeah. Hamilton, which was, like, that was an incredible season. Right. But then now they have a cap, and Verstappen is just, you know, taking it out of the park. Whereas all of a sudden Lewis Hamilton is like, oh, you're you're a really good driver, of course. Yeah, but but you do you can't not buy have wins. Exactly, I like that. I like that they're capping it. Um, I think, I think it. You don't just go. Who spent the most? It's not like an election, right? Who spent the most money? Right. Oh, well, they're going to win. Like, mm -hmm. I don't. We don't want that. We want to see like, hey, at least like you should be able to do what you want to do, but like to a point, and then everything under that's fair game. I think that's cool. I like that concept. Yeah, and I'm not the, the most, you know. 
F1 guy and all this, but I got the little app and I follow it and like oh, I try and, and I the, love the show, you know, guy. and I follow it like once in a while, but I don't look at it every day, but I kind of keep up yeah. on it. You know, when I think about it, like, I'm going to check and see what's going on. I really want to go to a race. I was going to uh, ask you. I, I want to go to a race. I mean, so there's bad. one in Austin. Yeah. Austin, Miami, and Vegas. Miami um, and Vegas have them now too. Yeah. Just, I remember when, just there were, those. when there were none in America and Austin was the first yeah. one. I really want to go, but I want to go with, I want to take my little brother. I want him, him to go with me because he kind of got me into F1. Mm-hmm. Uh, I want to go with him and like, you know, one or two other people and just be like, I want to take my daughter too, uh-huh. like, and just, but I want to do it right. Like, I, it's expensive. Yeah. yeah. It's not cheap, but like one of those, like, Hey, you sit in, like, you've got your thing and it's like, you're not just sitting in a, you know what I mean? Like you're not like just a booth a, experience or yes. a club or something. If anybody is out there that's rich and has one of these, like call me. Yes. Right. Like and call us. To get uh, yeah. To him. And Josh yeah. and Drew too. And, and we'll test but it out for Drew first. I would love yeah. to go to one. Apparently uh, there's F3 in Nashville. F three's coming to Nashville because they just had the Grand Prix. The Grand Prix prices, the IndyCar, yeah, those were actually not as bad as I thought. For one hundred twenty bucks, you can get four tickets for your family. Oh, but you're cheap. Yeah, but if you okay. want to do the the club suite, like you're gonna go in the suites, uh-huh. it was eight hundred and fifty dollars. But food catered by like barbecue and some Mexican taco place, free drinks. You have couches. You have TVs. Climate controlled. I was like. Wait, what? And that's for how many days? I think it was like think, all, was it all it's three, three days? Or four days yeah. yeah. That was eight hundred bucks for four days. Eight hundred and fifty bucks for four per person. I was like, that's when you factor it in, like that's a lot of money, but that's some good value. Mm-hmm, so absolutely. I really wanted to go, but it was raining that weekend and it was like oh. so crazy. I want to go to F one race really bad. Yeah. Was, so I, so I want to go down the pits. I wanna I want to get down there. Josh and I want to go to one too. So yes. agreed. Yeah. Let's do it. No one brother. asked me if I wanted to go, but I would like to go oh, too. Oh, Joe, 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 Joe with us. Go. Joe Neal, dude. I would love to go with him. Yes. It's Joe been a long hilarious. time since the three of us. You know Joe is? He'd walk right up in the pits, like, walking like, he looks like a damn dinosaur when he yeah. walks. Like a little, <laughs> a little T-Rex. He's like, hey, man, what you doing? What's yeah. that? You know, and like, everybody just likes Joe. Like, yeah. he'll be, before you know it, him and Verstappen would be laughing, you know? Yeah. And he'd be like, oh, yeah. I'm like, wait, what? What are you... How the how the hell did that happen? You'll you know? see him behind the wheel. Yeah, he's like, "Mind if I sit in your car?" And I'll be like, "Get in there!" You know, like, <laughs> yeah. like hilarious. But yeah, but like Joe, get my brother Kevin to go. I bet that's something I really want to take my daughter to. Like, yeah. he's got like a group and like, hey, get one of those things. Mm-hmm. And like my wife and daughter, my daughter would have the best time. She would effing love it. Yeah, she would so love it. So she loves cars. She loves stuff like that. It's awesome. That's, that's good. I gotta say, she's cool. a cool kid. Yeah. I'm pretty proud of what my wife and I have done with that little child. Yeah. So I'm trying not to mess it up, you know? That's awesome. That's all we're trying to do is yeah. not mess up. <laughs> yeah. Well, well, Drew, thank you very much. We appreciate your time, man. Yeah, I did. I had a great time. And uh, bearsolutionsllc.com. Yeah. And uh, what is your youtube we'll throw it up on the description it's bear solutions on youtube everything's bear solutions so straight, straight up website bear solutions llc.com uh agonic is live agonic.com so l-i-v-e-a-g-o-n-i-c.com um uh, instagram is instagram bear is bear solutions youtube's bear solutions x is bear solutions and then agonic is just agonic llc on social media gotcha so, yeah. Right. right. Well, Doing that man. We got a lot you, of training uh, classes coming up. So, yeah. we got to head out again tomorrow. I'm All driving right. to New Hampshire. I'll be with Ian in New Hampshire tomorrow. Oh, nice. and then Buffalo, New York the next weekend. Tell him we said, hey. Yeah, dude. See if he's got any new uh, Viking tattoos on him. Yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. And make him get a picture with you like Eastern <laughs> Promises. <laughs> he's so that so, guy. Yeah. So, cool, man. Well, thank you for being here. Thank you for your friendship and for just everything that you do, man. Absolutely. Appreciate you guys. Thank you very much. Appreciate it, buddy. Yep. Thank you. Appreciate you. Thanks, Nick. All right. Guys, today we are got... <laughs> no, you're messing me up. <laughs> combat deployments. They weren't all combat deployments. Before that, he went on seven deployments with fifth... Did he always go with fifth? Seven deployments to Iraq, Afghanistan... Where all did he go? <laughs> Dude, where all did but, he go? Was it always with the fifth group? <laughs> Were they all combat deployments? <laughs> You guys, but- today we are... <laughs> <laughs>